Welcome everybody to the planning board meeting for March 17th, 2021. I will begin with roll call as we are um, remote and that is required before I can do anything else. Alden Clark. Here. Beth DeLeal. Here. Ann Gardner. Ann. I'm sorry, I'm here. <clears throat> Tanya Hartford will be late. Uh, is Leah McGavern here? She's also going to be late, but they're both expected. Rick Tainter? Here. MJ Verde? Here. Don Walters? Here. Bonnie Sontag here. Linda Guthrie is here as our note taker, as are Andy Port, Director of Planning Development, and Caitlin Sullivan, the planner. We have one agenda item, public hearing um, on um, the Institution for Savings, Site Plan Review, ITIF Special Permit, and DOD Special Permit. Um, other business will be approval of minutes, any updates we have, and then we'll call it an evening. Uh, I will start with the first item. I just want to say for people uh, attending outside of the board to remind you that um, all documents are available online as required or as needed. Um, Andy Port will be showing on the screen documents that we need for review. Um, but if you go to the city website and click on planning board, you will see um, the agenda for tonight and the associated um, uh, agenda items with their documentation. All right, um, beginning um, now the continued hearing on um, the Institution for Savings. Let me just review the process I intend to follow tonight. Um, the applicant will present their um, revised plans. We will then have public comment followed by planning board members who will respond to everything they've heard and seen. And then um, we'll ask for the applicant to respond. After that, we're gonna come back to the planning board and we're gonna go through a review of the special permit for a DOD and general special permit criteria, as well as the site plan review criteria. And uh, after that, we will ask also for the applicant if they have any response, and then we'll determine next steps. I also wanna um, let everyone know that attorney Jonathan Eichmann from KP Law, the um, city solicitors uh, firm is here to advise the planning board as needed. So I will turn it over to, uh, I believe it's attorney Mead is going to be representing the applicant to start us off. Thank you, Madam. We just lost you. Yep, I think I'm back. Are you there? Yeah, I think you are back, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering when you expected uh, Ms. McGavern and uh, Ms. Harding and whether or not the board wanted to go on and approve their minutes while we waited for them? Um, okay, we can do that. Um, I will change the order of events then for um, approval of the minutes from our previous meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you. Second? I can second that, MJ. MJ. Any uh, comments? All right, I'll take um, roll call on approval. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Uh, abstain, I wasn't there. Thank you. Uh, Tanya doesn't seem to be here yet, nor is Leah. 
So I will move on to Rick. Yes. MJ. Yes. Don. Yes. And Bonnie, yes. Um, a qu let's do a quick up, just quick updates, just to remind you of something you already know about. Um, there's going to be a joint public hearing with the Planning Development Committee on um, March 25th to discuss the uh, um, proposed amendment to Section 6C of the Zoning Ordinance. Rick and I will be attending, but we're going to need three other people to attend. Um, Caitlin, uh, would you please send out a message to everybody um, to see if we can get, certainly anybody else, everyone else can attend, there's no problem, but we need a minimum of, of five um, to create a, qu a quorum for that night. Um, and just so you know, uh, Rick and I have put together a presentation because it is a planning board proposal and we um, agreed with Councillor Shand that it would be very helpful to her um, if we could go through the details of it. Um, so we will do that as briefly as we can and then other board members can certainly chime in and answer questions and respond to public comment that night. So again, that's March 25th. Um, I'm not remembering exactly what time it is, but Caitlin can tell us that when she um, sends out the request for participation. I see Leah is six, here. Pardon me? It says 6 p.m. on the uh, website. Okay. Good, okay, so it's six o'clock. I just hadn't noted that, thank you. Bonnie, is that um, presentation you're planning to um, do with Rick available for us ahead of time or not? Oh, sure. Let me make a note to send it to you. I believe actually that's not uh, being posted, is it not? Has it been? Uh, if not, we can make sure that it is. It, that would be that's typical. A better, that's a much better idea. It should be posted anyway in advance of the meeting. And um, Yeah, so way. Caitlin and I can check with Diane and just make sure that's posted to the same uh, 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 posting for the meeting. Great, and that would be posted under uh, City Council Planning and Development Committee, right? Correct, the joint public hearing, correct? Yeah, okay, good. All right, um, that was the only update I had. Did, did, does anybody else have any updates so we can keep ourselves occupied for another couple minutes? Madam Chair, I was most concerned about uh, Ms. McGavern who had missed another meeting and I don't believe that uh, Ms. Harding has. So um, if she comes and picks up, that would probably be good, but I was most concerned about Ms. McGavern. Oh, okay, good. Well, she's here. So let me turn the meeting over to you, Honey Mead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, with me, Lisa Mead, Mead Telemann Costa, 30 Green Street in Newryport. And with me this evening is uh, Mike Jones, the president and CEO of the Institution for Savings, Kim Roth, Chief Operating Officer, Christopher Angelakis, the architect from ARC, Joanne Sang from ARC, Nick Betts of Meridian Engineering, Dr. Judith Sowen, our historic architect, um, William Young, our historic preservationist, uh, Ron Miller from uh, Muller Associates Traffic Engineer, and Sean Fitch of City Lifts. Um, we're here again, as the board knows, to continue our request to um, construct an addition on the back of the 93 State Street Institution for Savings building. Uh, once again, the bank has listened to the comments of the board, we believe, uh, to the extent that those comments could be acted upon and still allow the bank to achieve its intended purpose of the property, the bank has employed those suggestions. Uh, the changes that you will see uh, Mr. Angelakis prepare for you and present to you this evening include the fact that the facade along Prospect Street has dramatically been altered. The architect has separated the facade by designing a greater break, including the introduction of new material and color and a change of roof line in the middle of the building, which carries through to the Garden Street side. The door has been added in the middle of Prospect Street as well as the corner of Prospect Street as a side entrance drive. There are divided light windows which have been employed throughout the building. The area around the garage door has been revised to include a different window pattern similar to the remainder of the divided lights. Additionally, the material around the door is brick. 
thereby not calling attention to this area. The garage door itself is also of a different color, more neutral against the brick facade. Um, all of these ch changes continue to break down the mass and scale of the building. Andy, if you could go to the site plan, I think it's probably uh, four, three or four. Uh, and go to the next, uh, the next one, please. There we go. So I'm just going to uh, go over the site plan here for a minute. The only change to the site plan from the last time the bank was here a month ago uh, is uh, as a result of the changes regarding the facade. So you'll see a sidewalk in the middle of the Prospect Street um, entrance there um, that we included, as well as there's a, a different entrance along uh, the corner of Prospect Street uh, to allow the sidewalk into that corner door. Um, and that is the only change that exists in the site plan since our last meeting. And with that, um, Madam Chair, I'm gonna have you go down uh, to slide 12, please, Andy, and I'm gonna turn this over to Christopher uh, to review the changes in the architectural plans. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, yeah, we are looking at this uh, project again in, in similar to the way we looked at it last time. We are gonna show where we were in the last meeting versus where we are now, just to show the, um, the change in uh, architectural features that, that we did and, and um, hopefully show that, that you know, significant, um, significant changes happened. Um, and uh, what we fo focused a lot on is, is a number of the comments that were made last time that, that, were, um, that made, made a lot of sense. And so we wanted to react to that pretty strongly. So if you can click through to number 13 here, you can see even from this uh, State Street side, um, you know, taking some of the suggestions of, of looking at the materiality of the connector between the Prospect Street um, uh, parts of the building and, um, in the in in how we connect back to the AIDS building, start to um, start to blend in materia materially, which in in, uh, in architectural terms would is really sort of to to not call attention to that area. Um, so the way we're accomplishing that is is actually matching the brick color of the 1980s edition while using a sympathetic color for the for the garage door, which would also um, be in unison with um, with the window framing and the rest of the project. And like, like uh, previous, we're gonna sort of go to 14 and then quickly 15. This is, you know, in, in lieu of doing a walkthrough, you can see where we were before, where we are now. That it's not that easy to see because there is gonna be foliage in the way there. 16 steps a little closer. And again, 17 shows uh, that what happened there. You can see between 16 and 17, we actually pulled a couple of cars off the street and the, the reason we did that is so we can make sure we're pointing out some features. There's, and you know, we wanted to make sure it was very clear what we were doing. If we were doing this in, in, a, in a more live model, we could just move the model around. But um, that's the only reason you see a couple of cars pulled away here. 18 steps a little closer and we'll pause here for a second because we can look at these uh, manipulations a little more clearly. So at this, at this perspective, you'll be able to see a couple of other things that changed so if you drop down to 19, you can see that garage door connector piece has gone to brick. However, you can also see very clearly that we thought that we had an opportunity of looking at the windowing differently to bring a different scale down to the building. So uh, looking at divided lights um, as a scalar device, um, we thought had some merit as, as we continue to hear comments about, about perceived scale and size. And so that as an architectural device, we thought that was something worth exploring and, and, and ultimately liked. You can start to see that the Prospect Street corner here um, just left of the scale figures. Um, we are showing a, a, what, what this is a door or at least it, it approaches it's a, uh, visually to be a door, um, suggesting a, an entry. And then you can start to see how the Prospect Street elevation was manipulated. And, and really it comes down simply to having a stronger sense of symmetry. So there are a, 
a, a series of five windows um, to one side and series five windows to the other, and we broadened the the break between the two perceived masses with a with a limestone uh, a limestone break in which also receives a series of ganged windows. So we can see that a little closer as we a little bit later when we're uh, the next. Uh, you can look at the next couple of slides. You can see we were starting to swing around here. You can quickly go to twenty one. And in that in that uh, in that break in between the two brick masses, uh, you're starting to see another indication of entry, which we thought was also a good suggestion. And then we're going to swing around to Garden Street side here really quickly. Um, you can see you'll be able to see very quickly as we toggle between twenty one and or twenty two and twenty three that uh, that kind of coursing of the limestone in the Divided light windows also find its way back to the back facade to keep things unified. Uh, now we're, yeah, and they're going to turn on to Oda Street. And um, you're not going to see a lot of difference here. You might see if you, when you go to 25, you'll see that the divided light windows start to come into play. Um, but the setbacks have been maintained. Uh, we felt that that was something that was well received, and we wanted to make sure to maintain that. Uh, 26 and 27 are just two closer views of that same thing. In 28, and then click to 29, you'll start to see the, the broadening of that um, middle block separation to um, brings the symmetry of Prospect Street um, into, into, uh, into a more true symmetry. And then 3031 is sort of a detail of that, of that facade as we're up a little closer. And then 32 and 33, again, are aerials, just uh, uh, these are uh, to, to be consistent with the, all the different presentations, but you can you'll you'll see kind of the aerial view shift based on the material changes and some of the massing changes that we did. And then 34 and 35 uh, is just a, a rotated version of that. And here you can hold here and just see the manipulation of the landscape buffer in front on the Prospect Street side to indicate. Um, or suggest where that entry might be. That's that's what uh, Attorney Mead was uh, showing. Is is truly the only uh, difference in the in the uh, site plan and landscape plan uh, in this submission. And if we click through to, uh, we're going to go through this again a little bit, but in a much more realistic uh, rendering technique. So if you start on thirty seven. Um, it's not not that much not that much new to say. I think what we can talk about here a little bit more is uh, the materiality. We're maintaining slate roof. We're maintaining uh, two colors of brick. You can click through to 38, uh, 39. You can go to 40. Two, two colors of brick, lintels and sills of limestone. Uh, Divided light windows, which uh, we're showing now as having similar dark framing uh, to both the 1980s edition and uh, several several adjacent buildings, and also uh, kind of uh, making some visual connection to uh, some of the framings on the 1970, uh, 1871 building. You can click to 41. Here you can start to see the expression of the divided light windows a little bit more, 42. And here you can start to understand the tone of the limestone against the brick, um, something that's very common uh, as you get further into, into downtown Newburyport, this kind of lintling in, in brick facade, uh, 43. And 44. And 45. Yeah, uh, this is a view that we didn't, we weren't showing in our previous model, but we did in these, in these, just to show a sort of sense of street continuity that that we believe we've accomplished. Um, and 46 really just shows um, it's it's really to be just transparent about what what you know if you were to take a theoretical section through the right along the fence line of Garden Street, what what is actually um, happening there? And I, I would I would note here that um, 
that that the gray, the light gray doors in framing here, um, I think the intention for us, or the architectural intention is that for the be dark, uh, kind of dark brain, bronze uh, color, similar to uh, the other framing in, in window framing. Um, and then we, if, if we click through to 48, um, these, the shadow studies haven't changed. The, 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 the dimensional uh, properties of, of the eaves in the, uh, and the, uh, the roof lines have not changed except for there's, there's just less pitched roof because, the, because the, the center divider on the Prospect Street got wider, so there's less of it, but that, that does not change the shadow uh, studies all. If we and if we can remember back to last time we talked about this, these shadows don't cast any deeper shadows than than the buildings uh, down Prospect Street on on the um, as you can see down. So for instance, on the 3 p.m. image, uh, the series of houses uh, on the bottom right cast about the same shadow. Um, and what you could see in the model, but you can't see here, is that those shadows don't roll up on the buildings across the street. Um, to the first, you know, they, they don't roll up anywhere to the first, uh, the cell height of the, of, of the windows there. The next image will, sh will just show, uh, so that's in the March, this is June, so summer shadows are very, very short. Uh, and when you get to autumnal, uh, the autumnal equinox, we're back to this, where we were uh, in the vernal equinox, and then winter, of course, we have very long shadows uh, almost all day long, uh, and that's that's uh, that's the nature of winter. Um, uh, but again, you know, pointing out that the shadows of our building are are the same length as is is uh, the adjacent buildings down the street. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, with that, I would like to um, go over a few things. So as you just saw, the building clearly is separate and apart from the original structure and massing, which is similar to the scale and massing of the surrounding residential structures. Um, so first I'd like to discuss the Secretary of the Interior standards. Several comments at the last meeting from both the board and some members of the Historic Commission implied that somehow the bank was limited under the Secretary of the Interior standards to constructing an addition which was smaller in footprint or volume than the existing structure. I'd remind the board that when considering the existing structure for the purpose of the DOD, due to how the city has interpreted the DOD, one must include the 1980 edition, which is part of the original structure. But there's nothing in the Secretary of the Interior Standards that requires all additions to historic structures to be smaller than the historic structure itself. The standards require, and I quote, that new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. That's standard 10. Standard nine provides that new additions, exterior alterations or related new construction will not destroy historic materials, features and spatial relationships that characterize the property. The new work will be differentiated from the old and will be compatible with the historic materials, feature, size, scale, and proportion, and massing to protect the integrity of the property and its environment. We believe that the proposed standards as presented meets, the proposed expansion meets these standards. Now, there's been much discussion by this board and some members of the Historic Commission that a comparison of volume new to old is an appropriate comparison when applying the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And while the Chair of the Historic Commission has conveniently forgotten those comments and discussions, I want to show the board that such a comparison is misplaced under the standards. Andy, if you could go to, um, you, slide, you put me out of order here, um, go down to the first slide after the Tangrams renderings, please, which is the, um, library uh, shows the comparison of, um, I believe the first one is the Milton Library. Sorry, is that in your uh, your other? Nope, it's it's in this. It's just go down after the tangrams slide down. Okay. 
Yeah, it's not clear to me. Uh, are you talking about these right down here? Yep, thank you very much. Okay. So um, this is the Thomas Crane Library in um, Quincy, Massachusetts. These are examples from the bank's expert, William Young, of additions to historic structures, which comply with the Secretary of the Interior Standards and which are, as you can see, substantially larger than the original structure. So you can see that because in this particular example of the Crane Library, the original structure is on the left, and you can see the additions that basically surround it and go all around this, the right side of it. You will see in Mr. Young's commentary that these structures received review and approval by the Massachusetts Historic Commission as consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. If you go to the next slide, please. This is the Needham Free Public Library. So if you look at the picture on the right at the front, that is the right bottom, that is the original library. You can see the addition to the rear. And as you look overhead, you can see how the addition goes completely around the building and to the back. And the back has multiple stories. If you go to the next slide, please. This is the Milton Public Library. And again, you can see in the upper right and lower right, uh, the original library building in the front and the much larger, taller building in the back. Thank you. These are examples that are important because they show how the Secretary of the Interior Standards are about proportion and not dimension. For the applicant, perhaps one of the most frustrating aspects of the Historic Commission review and in turn this board's review is that the goal line seems to keep changing. Case in point, for two months or more, the Historic Commission and some members of this board have spoken about height and volume. Now, after the bank's experts point out that the analysis and comparison is not valid under the Secretary of the Interior Standards, the chair of the Historic Commission has on his own opined that really what they're talking about is the overall mass rather than a few selected dimensions, even though at the last meeting, he questioned whether the building Eve could drop by a foot. Further, the comments from Mr. Richards again discounts or eliminates a part of the historic structure to suit his purpose. Last meeting, he eliminated the existence of the height of the front part of the building of the original structure. This week, in his comments to the board, he eliminates the front portico of the historic building for length. Further, there continues to be a quest to eliminate the 1980 structure, which under the DOD is integral to the existing structure itself. One does not have the privilege of discounting portions of the original structure just because it serves a convenient per personal purpose. The zoning is applied as a whole, not selected pieces and parts. The board and the historic commission early on in this process both opined that given the location on the lot, the proposed addition did not distract or detract from the 1870 structure. Indeed, some of you noted that it was like a separate structure on the same lot. That has not changed. And while this is the case, some members of the Board and Historic Commission continue to seek numbers which are of no relevance or find no place in the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Indeed, they find no place even in our zoning ordinance, like volumetric comparisons. You should know, for example, that the Prospect Street facade of the existing building is 147 linear feet, whereas the proposed addition along Prospect Street, it is 87.5 linear feet. And yes, that is the entire building as it is defined in the DOD, which is the standard we must use. The length of the addition adjacent to the Garden Street properties is 118 feet 11 inches, still shorter than that of the existing structure. Similarly, we know that the facade of the sections of the proposed structure are shorter than the three main buildings on the northerly side of Prospect Street. Are these dimensions you should review? I don't know. We know that the eave of the height of the proposed structure is slightly taller than the eave height of the three main buildings on Prospect Street, but the ridge height is shorter than those residential structures. Similarly, we know that the eave height and the ridge height of the proposed structure are shorter than that of the 1870 structure. Are any of these dimensions important alone? The answer is no. Indeed, under the Secretary of the Interior Standards, the question is more of proportion and overall review. How does it work? Is it consistent with the DOD? 
is it compatible with and does not detract from the 1870 or the 1980 buildings? The question is and always has been, will the proposed addition be compatible with the historic materials, features, size, scale, and proportion and massing to protect the integrity of the property and its environment? We have shown through testimony of two experts with extensive experience in designing and reviewing historic buildings under the Secretary of the Interior Standards that the bank's proposal meets this standard. As you are aware, the addition has been positioned at the rear of the parcel, attached not directly to the historic bank, but rather a later addition. This circumstance alone would ensure the new addition's reversibility as well as visually subordinate relationship to the original building. These gestures might in themselves be enough to meet Secretary of the Interior standards, which are famously receptive to contemporary designs as we've just shown you. Nonetheless, as a committed partner with the community, the bank recognizes the value in balancing the addition's aesthetic expression in a manner that is also receptive to the historic character of the surrounding neighborhood. Therefore, the current design, articulated massing, its familiar height, its traditional materials and fenestrations, its generous setbacks as compared to the rest of the neighborhood, and provision of plant materials combine to achieve a compatibility with both the historic bank and its context. Now I want to turn to the DOD overall. And if you could slide back down to where those other slides were, um, I have a slide of the DOD, please. So after the last library slide I showed you, I think it's the second to the last slide in this deck. Thank you, that's it right there. The board is also governed in their decision making by the DOD determinations, purpose and criteria. The board's decision must be based upon the terms of the ordinance. The board must not only and first look at the relationship of the proposed structure to the historic structure, its place on the property, and then in the neighborhood, but also in the district. The board must examine the proposal in the context of the district, which includes an underlying business district as well as residential districts. As I noted previously, the city council, when it determined when considering projects under the DOD that these foundations must be kept in mind. Under section 27A determinations, the city hereby determines all of the following, and I quote, the architectural, cultural, economic, political, and social history of the city of Newport is one of the most valued and important aspects. Section 27B, purposes. And I quote, a downtown overlay district and discretionary DOD special permit are established due to the unique land use pattern and architectural, economic, and cultural character of the buildings, structures, and lots, both individually and as a group that are located in downtown Newburyport. The DOD lays over the economic center of our city. That is reflected in the determination and purpose section of the ordinance. What drives economics? Successful business. Businesses that are allowed to grow and meet the standards of the time. As a result, when reviewing a project, the board must keep in mind that the intent is to allow these characteristics to continue. So what is downtown Newburyport? What is the DOD and how does this proposal compare to other similar situations in the DOD? Before you is an overlay slide of the DOD. Those are the cross hatches taken directly from the city's zoning map. The DOD is replete with edges of the district, which are directly adjacent to a residential districts or directly adjacent to wood frame residential structures. Those edges include commercial structures, some two and a half or three stories taller, tall or taller. So on the left of this picture, you're gonna see the Garrison Inn over on Titcomb Street. The Garrison Inn is four stories or four and a half stories tall and directly across the street from the church and right next to 
uh, wood frame residential structures. You'll also see right above that photograph, a picture on Titcomb Street, looking down toward the Congregational Church, uh, which also includes a two and a half story uh, building of multifamily and wood frame structures. At the top, you'll see the Garrison Inn, which is actually one, two, three, four and a half stories tall, as you can see, right on the edge across the street from residential wood frame structures. Over off of Middle Street, um, you can see the two and a half story um, brick building up against the opposite side, wood frame structures that are shorter. And you can see on Essex Street, similarly, the brick facade buildings across the street from wood frame structures. Um, and down at the bottom of the picture, again, on Essex Street, you see the brick three-story um, building, commercial building against, directly against and up against the wood frame structures. This is the DOD. Of course, these examples, as we provided to you previously over a year ago, exist in various parts of the city, but here they are exactly in the DOD. What is being proposed here is not an aberration, merely a continuation of a historic land use pattern, that which is described to be protected in the DOD. Further, the proposal is completely in line with the City Council's stated determination and purpose of the ordinance. What is being proposed is entirely consistent with the historic zoning and land use patterns of the DOD. And if you can move to the last slide, please. In preparation for this meeting, we reviewed all of the minutes and recordings of the prior planning board hearings on this application. As the board is aware, the bank has met with this board seven times over the last 13 months. Each time the bank has provided substantive changes to their proposal at the request of either this board, the historic commission, or the neighbors. The requested changes have not been insignificant. At times, they have been completely different from requests of prior meetings. The bank has acted on all of these requests, which have included definitive direction. At times, direction in and among board members has conflicted, and the bank has had to decide which comments to address. As an example and reminder, 13 months earlier, 13 months ago, at the very first meeting of the board, before COVID, the bank had originally applied for an ITIF special permit for parking to count those spaces toward the bank's parking as permitted under the ordinance in the Harris Street lot. That meeting was attended by numerous citizens from all over the city who were worried about the impact on the Harris Street lot and other parking spaces on the street. In response, the bank made accommodations on site to provide all of their required parking and comply with the on-site parking requirements of the city. This included a significant redesign of the proposal. It also alleviated the concerns of many members of the public and of this board. Indeed, none of those members of the public have resurfaced for these hearings, but for the immediate neighbors. It was not the original plan of the bank to provide all of its parking on site. However, in order to alleviate these clearly expressed concerns and comply with the requirements of the ordinance, the bank is incorporating all of its parking on site. This is not what they originally wanted, but is what is needed and required. Upon review of the minutes, we found that in August, Mr. Tainer suggested maybe the bank should look at putting the addition on the State Street portion of the property. However, that suggestion was dismissed after discussion by the board and the applicant. Yet, after 13 months and six redesigns later, that suggestion was again made, notwithstanding the prior apparent dismissal of the suggestion. Both of our experts say that it is the antithesis of the Secretary of the Interior Standards that, went, that such an addition would block the prominent side of the historic structure and require an attachment to the historic structure. And importantly, it would not be compatible with the flow of banking operations and vehicular traffic on this site, which would be entirely funneled down Prospect Street. A member of the Historic Commission suggested that the building be clad in wood siding, similar to the residential structures in the neighborhood. This position was later adopted by the Planning Board. 
the bank undertook this redesign, only later have the resulting design dismissed by the board. Upon review of the minutes and recordings in the meetings, as well as our copious notes, members had a varying degree of comments, some which were specific enough to be acted upon and some which were conclusory and or contradictory and which gave the bank little ability to act upon. The resulting plan before you is the result of six redesigns of the proposed addition and incorporation of many of those comments. The bank has been responsive to the comments of the board understanding those comments, but also needing to meet its business needs on this commercial property in this historically commercial district. The bank has again revised the plans. I remind the board of the following. The bank is providing all required parking on site. The proposal will improve the stormwater discharge problems on State Street. The proposal meets the fire safety requirements. The proposal meets all of the technical requirements of site plan review, has been signed off on by the city engineer, the water department engineer, and the peer review engineer. Significant setbacks have been added off of Otis Place, much like a pocket park complete with benches. Setbacks and landscaping have been provided along Prospect Street. Materials such as a slate roof, limestone, granite, brick, and a copper cornice are employed to complement the 1870 structure. The generator has been fully enclosed and buffered from exposure, exposure to the neighborhood. The massing and scale of the proposal is in line with the commercial properties of Upper State Street, not Lower State Street. The proposed addition is appropriate for the 1870 structure and is compatible with the neighborhood without being a residential structure. The proposal is consistent with the DOD determinations and purpose. The proposal continues the unique land use patterns that are the DOD and allows for the expansion and solidification of the bank, the longest and most continuous economic generator and contributor to the DOD. While it is true that the DOD permit is a discretionary permit, such discretion is not unfettered, nor is it absolute. The SJC has opined on a number of occasions Applicants have a right to an honest, unfluenced opinion rendered in good faith by a town or city official or board charged with deciding whether under a bylaw or ordinance, a building is compar or comparable permit shall be issued. While neighborhood, put, while neighborhood input is required, the board is governed by and must make their decisions in accordance with the standards of the ordinance, an ordinance which serves an entire city, not just eight people in a neighborhood. Indeed, I would remind the board, as we pointed out a number of meetings ago, the bank has existed here now, now for over 200 years. The average ownership of the surrounding properties is 12 years for owner occupied buildings and 23 years for the ownership of rental properties. The bank is committed to the city. The zoning district has existed since before any of the adjacent residents owned their properties. Both those that are residential in the residential district and those now non-conforming residences in the B2 district and the bank will be here long after they leave. As the Massachusetts Appeals Court has stated, Applicants are also entitled to decisions, not based on emotion, but rather a calm reasoned approach to a just and fair decision based upon the facts presented. To that end, the bank respectfully requests that it has provided evidence on the record that it meets all of the criteria of the site plan review provisions. It has met the criteria of the DOD and therefore respectfully requests that the planning board approve both applications. And at the same time, the bank requests that the board approve and allow it to withdraw its ITIF special permit without prejudice. Thank you very much. Thank you for that comprehensive presentation. We will now go to public comment. 
I will remind everybody that any letters that have been submitted um, were uh, by midday today have been posted and read by planning board members. Um, when you speak this evening, um, give your name, your address, and you are limited to two minutes. Um, Alden, uh, would you mind um, keeping the two minute clock for us? That's fine. That great. Okay. Um, and uh, Andy will um, uh, let people in as the um, host. And okay, let's thanks, Pierre. Thank you, Chair Sontag. Uh, the first person we have from the audience is uh, Bill, uh, no last name. Uh, you'll need to unmute on your end as well to address the board. Sorry, got it. Hi, I'm Bill Bixby. I own a business and uh, a building at 33 State Street. Um, as a business owner, my concerns would be parking and aesthetics. And it seems that uh, the bank has uh, taken care of both those things. The building seems to fit in historically and uh, they've uh, supplied enough parking to, to take care of that. Um, my other comment is uh, the institution has always been just a, a fabulous supporter of the town, um, whether it be any nonprofit or in town or the business community chamber, they are always the number one uh, contributor and supporter of us. And uh, we totally support them. Um, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next person we have is Jim Poulin. Uh, Jim, are you able to unmute yourself? Are you there? We don't appear to be getting any audio. Uh, it looks like Jim might be having some problems with his mic, so we will hold off on that for just a moment. Um, next person we have is... Uh, Glenn Richards. Okay, thank you, Andy. Glenn Richards, 6th Street. Uh, well, uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself here, not the Historical Commission, but just so you know, those also in attendance, I know the board knows that I'm also uh, chair of the Historical Commission, and I'm trying not to be overly sensitive about what's the somewhat disparaging comments that have been made, but anyway, uh, you know, it's interesting how fate is just this evening after dinner, I was discussing with my son the meaning of the word sophistry. And it's kind of um, basically it's when you throw around a lot of fancy words and arguments to basically make a, a weaker argument appear stronger than it really is. And I, it's, so it's really ironic because I think that's a lot of what uh, what the applicant is doing here. And uh, I really take exception to the accusations that I keep changing my mind because to somehow as, as if height had no bearing on, on mass or size and, and this volumetric measurement was somehow something that zoomed in from outer space of no relevance to anything in the standards. So let me just, I'll just stick to that because you have my written comments and I hope you have a chance to look at those. But let's just take a look at this. The, the term massing is used over and over and over and over again. It was even, it, it, Ms. Mead even mentioned it tonight. It's important. And in the context of a building, you know, we're not talking about the mass in the terms of your high school physics class, how much propellant is it going to take to send the bank into escape velocity? That's not the kind of mass we're talking about here. We're basically talking about size. What is size? Size is the length times the height times the width. Very, very simple. You know, and and just tonight I learned from Ms. Mead's verbal comments that the dimension that was missing on their drawings is 108, well, essentially 119 feet, 118, 11 inches. And that dimension was omitted on their drawing. They just gave the 87 foot dimension to compare it. This is uh, looking in an isometric. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, oh, is that two minutes already? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Well then, um, geez, I don't know. I'll try to wrap it up then. I, I just really, you know, the idea that to compare, you can do, you can compare size without measuring anything is just strikes me as what the heck are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, I hope, you know, I don't know what else to say. Sorry, my two minutes is up. So I guess I'll have to leave it there and I'll leave my other comments to my written comments. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, next person we have is Tom Coulterjohn. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Tom Coulterjohn, 64 Federal Street, co-president of the Newburyport Preservation Trust. The trust still opposes this project in its present form. Unfortunately, this project still is, it impairs the integrity and character of the neighborhood. It is still detrimental to the neighborhood. No matter how many outside paid consultants the bank brings in, this proposal is not in harmony with the purpose and intent of the DOD. Patricia Pecknick's written public comments about the examples put forth by the applicant's consultants is very clear and precise. The examples do not at all represent the situation in Newburyport. There have been countless meetings. The bank wants what it wants, but that does not help the neighborhood or the city. This is a massive project still and has always been from the beginning. A small reduction does not make it any more palatable. We think it is time for a decision. I hope you will bring this to a vote tonight and that you will vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Mark Goldstein. Thank you, Andy. And I want to thank um, the, uh, the chair, Madam Chair, and the planning board for uh, the work that they do for the city of Newburyport. Um, again, my name is Mark Goldstein. I live on 172 State Street in Newburyport, and I'm also the president and CEO of Anna Jakes Hospital. I wrote a letter last March. I have the letter in front of me. It was March 13th. It was actually before the pandemic. And it was in support of um, the Institution for Savings Plan. And the basis of that support was built around the trust that I have in the management, uh, Mike Jones, Kim Rock, and their board of trustees. And thinking about all of the properties that they own and how special they are, not only in Newburyport, but on the entire North Shore. As it's been commented earlier, the bank has stepped up in every way possible um, to think about the perseverance and the flexibility and the commitment they have shown to rework and not give up on this incredibly important project for downtown Newburyport. You know, I, I, I happen to walk down State Street very often. I was there last night and I was looking around at so many empty buildings and storefronts and know how hard the pandemic has been on everybody. And I think about a project of this magnitude at this time and how special that is. I wanna just close by just reflecting on something that goes back to 1918. And the president of the bank of that time was H.D. Little. And H.D. Little stepped up and found a way to help Anna Jake's Hospital in 1918 to help battle the pandemic of 1918. For those of you who don't know, H.D. Little is the great, great grandfather of Charlie Baker. And this bank has shown time and time again that they do the right thing. Seeing this project tonight only reassures me that what their commitment is to the city of Newburyport. And I would really encourage you to support Good them you. and bring their project to closure tonight with a affirmative yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Uh, next person, let me just check again. Jim, uh, are you able to unmute and uh, speak to the board? Looks like Jim maybe still having an issue with the mic. Uh, next person we have is Tara Cederholm. Hi, uh, my name is Tara Cederholm. I live at 20 Fruit Street. Um, I wrote today my third letter to the planning board. Uh, regarding this um, application. And I, in you can all read my letter, so I'm just gonna point out three things that were not in my letter. First of all, I wanna point out that the Historic District Commission has done an amazing job and they have um, provided to the Planning Board four separate reports on this, um, stating that it was not, that this proposal is not compliant with the Secretary of Interior standards. And while the applicant has um, brought forth uh, experts that say it, ha it is compliant, those experts have been paid by the applicant. And the people that work for the Historic District Commission are all voters that work for our city who are charged with, with doing this on behalf of all the citizens of our city. So I would hope that the planning board would take that into consideration. I would also like to point out that in Ms. Mead's uh, presentation earlier, she uh, showed a plan and a map of the overlay of the city of Newburyport in which she showed many instances in which commercial buildings were juxtaposed against residential wooden frame buildings. It was a hard for me to see on Zoom because it was quite small mapped and I was squinting to see it, but I will just call to your attention one juxtaposition in which she juxtaposed the garrison inn against wood frame buildings. Many of you probably are well aware that the Garrison Inn was actually originally built as a residential structure in the early 19th century. And the fact that it is brick building has absolutely nothing to do with it current um, use as a commercial building, but that has more to do with the fact that in the early 19th century, there were a lot of fires. And so brick was the preferred building material to prevent your house from burning down. So the juxtaposition of a residential building against another residential building is really irrelevant in the conversation about the juxtaposition of commercial buildings today using today's building code, the city's building code against the, you know, juxtaposition with it. All right, and one last final comment is that the idea of whether the bank is a good corporate citizen to the city of Newburyport is irrelevant to the value of their application. And I encourage the planning board to vote no on this application. Thank you. Uh, Jim, are you able to unmute? Um, Jim, just to, to note, there is a call-in number on the city's website uh, meeting posting. If you wanted to try that instead, perhaps that would give you an audio connection. Um, in the meantime, um, our next speaker is Peter Mackin. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Peter Mackin. I'm on 13 Prospect. I just want to say that less than 30 days ago, the uh, members of this planning board objected to the size, the height, the mass, the scale, and the footprint of that space. Today, the proposal is the identical height, size, mass, scale, and footprint of that space. So nothing's changed except for the facade and the windows, period, okay? What I would say is it's really interesting to hear the comparisons that Lisa Mead has put out. All the comparisons are only the ones that are convenient for her. She compares it to the residential building when residential buildings when it's convenient and she compares it to the 1870s building when that's convenient. The poor comparisons of the other towns, Quincy, Milton and so forth, heck it looks like some of those buildings were built in a, in a forest, okay? It's not a historical downtown neighborhood. And you know, you want to protect, you say that this proposal protects your property. Well, what about protecting the residential neighborhood? This is not three separate buildings. They are all connected. It's one massive structure when you come down to it. Uh, the seven meetings that we've had, okay, and 14 months, at the end of the day, the building has not had any substantial, or many substantial changes at all in size, height, mass, scale, and footprint. All parties have been 
um, you know, I, I love the last comparison that you just made. The bank is 200 years old and the residents have only been in their house for 12 years. Well, how long has the bank president been in the bank? Okay, give me a break. That is the worst comparison I've ever heard. And then finally, I just wanna remind every single individual, every one of the residents in the South End live here 24 seven. The bank, the bank president, the employees, they come and go and eight to five, basically, okay? So that's all my comments. I totally oppose this, this uh, construction that's been going and proposals that, that have been going on for 14 months. It's still two and a half times larger than the 1870s building. Thank you. Yeah, uh, next person we have is Cindy Johnson. Oh, thank you, Andy, and thank you, New Report Planning Board. My name is Cindy Johnson. I am a trustee of the Institution for Savings, but I'm speaking to you tonight as a South End resident and a New Report business owner. I'd like to echo comments by the Chamber of Commerce and other community leaders in support of this project, and especially in support of our downtown businesses. This has been a long process, but the bank has demonstrated its responsiveness to this board's suggestions. The result, I believe, is a project that satisfies not only B2 zoning, the downtown overlay district, and is consistent with the character of our downtown. I think Lisa said that very well. But what I want to talk about is the purpose of the downtown overlay district and how its purpose can be subverted. I don't think it was meant to discourage business activity. In fact, it specifically states that the economic health of our downtown is one of its key drivers. Businesses wishing to expand in that context would seem to be a positive development in most downtowns. After all, the vitality of our downtown isn't historic buildings. We had plenty of empty historic buildings not too long ago. It's the people working, shopping, and eating in those buildings. And I can think of no better way to strangle our downtown than to send a message to businesses that B2 zoning is meaningless along its edges. Unlike some of these, the abutters who are leaving town, the bank has been downtown for 200 years and has no plans to leave. It has worked in good faith to be a good neighbor for 200 years, and it has worked in good faith with this board as many revisions can attest. Please don't send a message that businesses aren't welcome in our downtown. I urge you to approve this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next person is Tim Wacker. Well, good afternoon. Uh, we live at 13 Otis Place. I've uh, spoken on this matter before, so I'll keep my remarks brief. Uh, as has been uh, belabored tonight, this project's gone through many iterations, uh, it's many meetings, a lot of comments, and yet they don't seem to be making any headway. And the reason is that it's a bad project. It's not appropriate for this area. The whole city is getting built out in every way it can possibly be built out. The densities are skyrocketing, and you're gonna put this project on arguably the most constricted streets in the city. It just doesn't fit. You can change the windows, the curbing, the shrubs, the setbacks. It's all just lipstick on a pig. This thing is not the right project in this location. Uh, I'll leave the rest of the remarks for the other uh, the other eight of us, the butters. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Oh, and I also want to say the board has been doing a magnificent job. Thank you very much for watching out with the interests of ours, of the neighbors, and the uh, the bank as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next person is Chris Kiba. Hi, thank you, Andy, and thank you to the planning board. My name is Chris Kiba. I live at 14 North Atkinson Street my, with my wife, Candy, and our three boys. I work in Newburyport, and I'm on the Chamber of Commerce, and I serve on the Chamber's Economic Development Action Committee. I urge the planning board to approve this project. The Institution for Savings has been an integral part of this community since 1820, 200 years. We're very fortunate that they're here serving this community today. 
throughout this project, they have listened to concerns, they've been flexible, and they've done a fantastic job working with the boards. I feel that proposed project is thoughtful and in keeping with the character of the downtown. Also, their expansion plans include adding seven full-time employees at a time when this community could really use the jobs. Their proposed expansion of over $6 million will also increase their tax payments going forward. The Institution for Savings has been incredibly generous, donating millions of dollars to Newburyport charities in the past. Let's approve this project now and allow the IFS to build the additional footprint they require to continue to do an amazing job serving this community for the next 200 years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, next person we have, let me just make sure, we do have a couple of folks who have uh, spoken already, but it still appear to have their hands raised. Um, uh, Susan Edwards. I'm sorry, let me, I'm sorry, let me change my name. I am not Susan Edwards. This is Colleen Turner Sacchino, 15 this place. Um, God, I'm exhausted. Uh, the Historical Commission, the Planning Board have worked so hard. The bank has never talked to the neighborhood. They should be ashamed of themselves. Um, and ultimately, it is inappropriate for this enormous structure to be built. And Andy, I don't know if you can, but if you could show slide 33 or 38 right now, it is enormous, enormous, inappropriate, wrong. Just stop. I beg the planning board to say no. I beg you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next person we have is identified only as Matter. Uh, hi, uh, I am, I, this is not Matter. I work there and it's on my work computer. So this is Claire Papanas to see you uh, at 4 Otis Place. And uh, this is clearly separate from Matter. Uh, I'm in a butter, as I said, at 4 Otis Place. And there's a few things going on. I submitted several letters over the last 14 months. And there are a few things that really strike me from this evening's dialogue or um, comments from the bank and some of the trustees is one is, is that uh, none of the abutters have been uh, here for 200 years. So until they can show someone who lives until 200 years, um, you can give that comment some credence. What we're talking about is the legacy and the impact, the lasting impact of this structure. So, so much has gone on over the last 14 months. I really don't know where to begin, but I will begin with missed opportunities on the bank's part to show goodwill. And that's really important in this world today. Haven't seen it and in the spirit of community. The reality is, is that the issue all along, we've been very clear that it's been size. And, and it's not like the bank is adhering to the DOD guidelines or, or adhering to the guidance of the historical board, I mean, the historical commission and the planning board, they're not. What they're doing is proposing all these design changes, but we're not asking for design changes. We've been clear all along, it's size. So at what point do we say, um, why aren't you listening to us? And when are we gonna stop this? So I would love for us to have a vote this evening I thank the planning board. I thank the historical commission. I thank my neighbors. There's a silver lining in all this is that we've come together and, but we have to change this because we're spinning our wheels because an entity that has a lot of power and is wielding it wants to get what it wants. So it's up to the board to decide. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, no, oh, Mark, Madam Griffin. Chair, may I uh, speak? It's Mark Griffin, also at Fort Otis Place. We'll start the clock again for another speaker. Go ahead. Good evening uh, again, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, Mark Griffin, Fort Otis Place, direct the butter to the project. Um, I also thank the planning board for its careful consideration of these applications and its diligence over the many months which have gone by. I appreciate that there has been a good faith attempt by the board to try to get to yes 
by making suggestions to the applicant about what you want to see. Unfortunately, this accommodation has fallen on deaf ears and needs to stop. The bank has been very stingy about size reductions and has only made one notable reduction in 14 months. The latest plan shows no reduction whatsoever and an unwillingness to move on this issue. This intransigence is not worthy of further deference or continuances. Meanwhile, the abutters have been continually mobilized for each and every hearing, many times to be disappointed by a last minute continuance. Some abutters have expended large sums of money in legal fees. All have expended their time and effort to make their voices heard for 14 long months. It is definitely time to bring this matter to conclusion. I believe the Historical Commission's report and member comments reflect the standards that the bank has not met for approval of a DOD special permit. To allow this permit is to provide the example for other such projects in the DOD. You might also consider that the Newburyport Bank and TD Bank could propose similar additions in their parking areas. I request that you follow the advice of the Historical Commission as contemplated by the DOD and that you vote to deny the special permit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Marianne Clancy. Yes. Hi, uh, Marianne Clancy, 16 Neptune Street, speaking in support of the project. First, um, I just have to say, I find it really interesting that the last three speakers are, are just a handful of the abutters that um, are in the process of moving out of the neighborhood that have their houses under agreement. Um, you know, by the time the ink that is dry, is dry on any of these agreements, they'll be long gone. So I just think that we should keep that in mind. Um, you know, you've already heard a lot about the ambiguous uh, requests that the bank has been asked to make and, and their efforts to do that. You know, all along, the bank has really just wanted guidance from this board. Um, even one of your own members asked uh, the board members a couple of meetings ago to really provide more specific guidance and let us know, how, you know, if, if this plan is going to work or never going to work. You know, I was former mayor, you all know it. Uh, when I worked at City Hall, the planning board's goal was really to provide guidance to applicants with the ultimate goal of one of two things, either getting to yes or letting the applicant know early on that their plan would never work. That's all we asked for. Uh, none of those things have happened. Um, and in fact, the guidance has changed at every turn and there are the transcripts to prove that. Um, I wonder if it means anything to this board. Uh, probably not, but we'll, I'm going to throw it out anyway, that five former mayors uh, and including and one current mayor believe that this project is worthy of support and approval. Um, it's hard enough to get uh, mayors to agree on, uh, two mayors to agree to get six. So I think that's interesting. And I guess I would throw out the final question that is uh, if the neighbors, uh, four of who are gonna be gone shortly, one who lives in uh, San Diego, uh, were not opposed to this project, would planning board members be opposed? or would you vote to approve? And it's something that I hope that you'll all think about and ask yourself. Um, there is a prominent business downtown that would like to expand beyond, uh, that is not us, who's looking very carefully at what you do. And there's probably a lot of businesses that are doing the same thing. This particular business is looking to scrap their plans to expand and move someplace else. And you know what that means? That means that two dozen employees will be someplace else, not downtown, buying their lunch at Oregano's or Angie's or Middle Street Foods, but I'm you know, buying their food someplace else, and I think that's important. Uh, final comment: the city, you know, the city was founded uh, founded on this concept of urban living, houses and homes and businesses living together. The DOD, in its uh, explanation, explains that the unique land use patterns, architectural, cultural, economic, and cultural character of the building structures and lot, both individually and as group, that are located in downtown Newburyport. There is no clause at the end of that that says as long as the neighbors approve. So I would ask this board to respect the intent of the DOD and approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Steve Charette. Thank you, Madam Chair and planning board members for the opportunity to be heard. My name is Steve Charette. My wife and I are direct abutters and live at 16 Prospect Street on the corner of Prospect and Otis, 45 feet from the proposed expansion. We are also Newburyport business owners and our office is located on State Street. As both homeowners and business owners in the city, 
we've never objected to the bank reasonably and sensibly expanding their operations. And we've said that continuously for 14 months. The latest design, including some changes to the windows and facade continues to be design improvements. And we appreciate that many of these changes in design and placement provide some visual re relief from our vantage point living on the corner. However, we continue to oppose the project as presented based on its height, scale, and massing. It's shocking to us to hear the vitriol this evening, the vitriol that somehow the bank is listening to the guidance. They've had guidance from the New Report Historical Commission. They've had guidance from the planning board to reduce the size, scale, and massing, and they're not doing it. They're simply not following the guidance. Um, one planning board member said it best in our view many months ago. She said she's never seen a project with so many in opposition. The Historical Commission opposes it. The Trust opposes it. Most of the planning board members oppose it. All the neighbors oppose it. This is truly unprecedented, and her astute assertion hasn't changed one bit. This has simply been a bad project from the beginning. 14 months have passed. Perhaps now we can assume that this has become a strategic move on the part of the bank and council to simply wear everyone out into submission. But time doesn't miraculously solve the issue of sizing, scale, massing, and, and height. They've chosen not to solve it, claiming anything smaller won't meet their program needs. They may not get all of what they want, including a museum, a gym, showers, but they can certainly build something smaller to house seven employees and make it subordinate to the original structure. Thank you, planning board members, for your service and steadfast resolve to do what's right for all stakeholders. We ask that you deny this project as presented. I said this last time, and it bears repeating, and Peter Mackin said it tonight, that the bank has been 40 hours per week. We're here 168 hours per week, 4X, and we're here forever. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Jeff Caswell. Thanks, Andrew. Jeff Caswell, I'm in a building at 7080 State Street. I live in Newburyport. I actually have businesses downtown um, in the B2 district. I know everyone's upset about the size. They're trying to require, they're required to have a certain amount of parking. That actually makes the building bigger. That's a zoning requirement. I know the neighbors are upset. This is a business. They need to have a building that's accommodating to what they have to run as a business. I own buildings downtown. I have tenants. We have vacant spaces. We need commerce downtown. We need some like the Institute for Savings. Half these people are probably moving out and they're upset. I understand that, but they are neighboring a business district. And this is in keeping with downtown. I think the bank has done a great job listening to what they had to do. They're, B2, there's zero setbacks. They've given them setbacks. They've shrunk the building. That could be 35 feet tall. It's almost like the DOD is taking away rights from the business district. And it's, you're trying to impart residential stuff on a commercial district. I understand the DOD, but I just find it that as a business, they need to thrive. And I implore you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Ben Savoy. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I live at 17 Prospect Street. I am not moving. I've been here for 10 years. I'm gonna continue to move here, live here. Basically, uh, th this is not gonna hurt the, th their business one bit. It's a museum mostly. We live here constantly. And there are plenty of buildings that could use a museum downtown. Uh, if they're looking for space, it could easily help some of the other buildings. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is, uh, I guess, Lloyd and Linda Ham. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lloyd Ham, and I'm the CEO of Newbury Court Bank at 63 State Street. Uh, again, I'd, I'd like to start by commenting on the uh, the fairness, the approach the, the planning board has taken here, um, the uh, the energy the abutters have brought to it, but also the patience and the investment that the institution has brought forward. Uh, I am a supporter of this project as a business downtown. I believe that if we uh, continue to make it more difficult to bring employees into the downtown area, that it's going to continue to be a, a, a challenge. And if you do what I do, which is walk the streets every single day, in downtown Newburyport, you can't help but notice that our downtown district has become more fragile 
and will continue to get more fragile as fewer and fewer employees there. Every single day I watch my employees pass by my office window as they go out and try to move their cars in the streets. They have alarms on their desk and all of this. In this accommodation, they've dealt with the parking situation. I know a comment was made earlier about Newburyport Bank and expanding into its parking lot. The fact is that I don't have the patience, time or money that the institution has. And as I add employees, unfortunately, I'm likely to move them out of the downtown district and take those economic dollars away. But using just industry statistics, the average person working in their area spends about $20 within 300 yards of their employer in a downtown area uh, on a daily basis, 220 days a year, 25 employees add $110,000 in economic vitality to the businesses in the downtown district. We can't ignore this. And when you walk around in that area, you see our businesses are challenged and I, I appreciate what the abutters are saying. And I have always hoped that there was a clean solution, but I am more and more concerned um, that the beauty and the, and the wondrous nature of downtown Newburyport is going to become increasingly fragile if we have businesses locate their employees outside of the downtown. I wish everybody the best at finding a solution here, but I'm gonna state that I support this project. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Joseph Morgan. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Joe Morgan. I'm at 55 Hill Street in Newburyport, and I'm a commissioner on the Historical Commission in Newburyport. But uh, I wanted to add a few comments to uh, some initial comments I made last Thursday, uh, Thursday night um, at our last a commission meeting where we were asked to comment as commissioners on the feasibility of a state street solution. Um, I know that this has been mentioned already previously by attorney Mead as having been brought up uh, last year, but I think it's a, a solution, a potential solution that hasn't really been scrutinized enough. I've, I personally have not seen any plans or studies uh, that would might have been generated for that, but um, I, uh, I was, I'm an advocate for that solution. I think it's a consensus solution. It provides the visibility to an institution that wants to be visible in the, the city uh, as, a, um, as, a, as demonstrating its commitment. I think that what better commitment than um, strengthening its uh, image right on Main Street, uh, i.e. State Street. Um, and, um, um, and, and, and stepping forward. Right now, they've pushed their project to the rear of the site. I, I think on this historical site where there are many historical buildings on the perimeter, and <laughs> I mean, there are, there are no non-historical buildings really, um, is, is relating to the side of the site that actually declares itself as being um, a true player, a, a true business, a true, a true commerce, a true historical uh, partner in the city. Just as a, an idea of the size, if you look at slide 33, you see very clearly there's quite a bit of real estate there on that corner prospect and state. There's, uh, depending on how you set, do the setbacks, there's between 8,500 and 9,500 gross square feet. The existing footprint of the proposed building at the rear of the site is 7,500. Even if you were to provide additional setbacks along Prospect Street, you could easily realize the footprint that you currently have at the rear of the site. All the Two while- minutes. Thank you, also, all the while producing something that's much more in keeping for all of the very relevant precedents that attorney Mead provided uh, regarding the SOE, uh, the SOI, the, step, the standards. Uh, in other words, precedents for additions, not just new construction at the rear of the site, but in an actual addition to the historic building, much more in keeping with uh, a sense of place, a historical sense of place right on State Street, enhancing the image of the bank, and removing it from um, the view of the adjacent uh, houses at the rear of the site. I think it's really the solution that should be explored and it's really unfortunate that it hasn't. Thank you for listening and I thank the planning board for its time. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Anne-Marie Clausen. Good evening. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Clausen. I'm speaking for my husband, Aaron, as well. We live at 3 Otis Place, which is right across the street from the proposed project. Um, I want to thank the planning board for once again allowing the citizens of Newburyport 
to listen to us, to hear, hear our um, concerns regarding this project and reading the many, many letters that have been written in the last 13 months. Um, the, I also want to congratulate Glenn Richards for speaking and I've, on our behalf. He did a much better job than I could have ever done. I wish we could have had more time to hear him. And regarding Marianne Clancy's um, opinion, or it's irrelevant whether people are coming or going or moving or staying, it has nothing to do with this project. Um, the initial issues are still remain. The size, the height, and the massing are not changing. And I don't understand how the IFS can be so disrespectful to the planning board, the residents of Newburyport, the historic commission, and they just keep ignoring all of us time and time again. They ignored us and the DOD guidelines. I don't know how much disrespect they think they can get away with. We are sincerely opposed. We live here 24 seven. This affects our day-to-day -day living and it will affect our day-to-day -day living. I beg the planning board to please deny this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Stephanie Nikodic. Um, thank you, Director Port, uh, and thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Stephanie Nikitic, 93 High Street. <clears throat> uh, I want to note that I am one of uh, many non abutters who live in Newburyport and over the past 13 months have opposed this project. But tonight I want to highlight the written comment of Historical Commission Vice Chair Pecknick in case not everyone had a chance to read it. Ms. Pecknick debunks in detail the argument that three examples compiled by Mr. Young of large library additions in other cities are comparable to the IFS situation. The cited additions in Quincy, Needham, and Milton are all on much larger lots and abut parks, lakes, athletic fields, or woodlands. None abut historic neighborhoods or are on historic streetscapes. Whatever you call it, Massing, scale, proportion, volume, these are all concerns addressed in our DOD and the US Secretary of the Interior Standards. It is clear IFS will not reduce the size of its plan. And the building IFS is proposing, whether placed on the rear of the lot or on State Street, is just too big for this setting. I hope that you will vote tonight on this permitting and that your vote will be no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next person we have is Paula Renda. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Paula Renda of 16 Otis Place. I have attended every one of these meetings, um, written several letters. And um, but first of all, I'd like to thank the planning board um, for hearing our concerns. Um, finding a solution between the bank and the neighbors has always been our goal. However, truly it is frustrating that after 14 months, our continued suggestions to scale the size seems to fall on deaf ears, excuse the expression. As it stands now, the impact of this massive structure Will permanently affect our neighborhood. I urge you to vote no. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is Freeman Condon. Dean, can you hear me? We can hear you now. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Freeman Condon and I live at 6 Forest Road in Salisbury. I am a trustee of the Institution for Savings. I have said this before, and I mean it. This project is better, safer, and more attractive because of the suggestions of the planning board that we have incorporated. I commend you for your diligence. I speak tonight as a 
as a six-term, 18-year elected official that on occasion has voted to support a proposal that I did not fully agree with. I did so because the applicant met the criteria necessary. I learned my lesson the hard way. On the one occasion that I joined the majority in denying a license for I felt were good reasons, our decision was appealed and a judge ordered the issuance of the license and further ordered the town to pay the applicant $300,000 for his troubles. I know that it is near impossible to change a mind that is already made up, that to appeal to a closed mind is often futile. I hope that tonight you put aside personal prejudices, that you do not let a preference for something different cloud your judgment about what is allowed. This decision should not have to be made in a court of law after a long, costly, extended appeal. It is completely unnecessary. The good, decent, hardworking people of Newburyport should not have to spend their tax dollars defending a decision that many of them disagree with. Two the minutes. city is well aware that we intend to appeal any decision that we think is unfair. Our right to do so is allowed under the Constitution of the United States and under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Tonight, I urge you to approve this project with the many changes that you have asked for. Tonight, I ask you for a voice of reason. This is a reasonable, justifiable, and allowed use. In your heart, you know that to be true. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, two other hands. Jim, are you available to unmute yourself yet? You're still having issues. Um, we do have another hand raised here, Sean Sullivan. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is Sean Sullivan. Uh, I live at 9 Prospect Street. Uh, I'm a direct abutter uh, across from uh, the proposed uh, bank parking structure. Um, it's been a, over a year uh, we've been going on with this. It's been a very long year. Uh, and the bank has continued to ignore the, the neighborhoods, uh, the historical commissions, and the planning board's requests and suggestions to reduce the size, height, uh, and massing of this project. Um, it's been a, a constant, uh, you know, back and forth. And no matter how many times uh, we've asked, um, there's been no addressing the, the core issue here. Uh, instead of listening to our town's experts, like the Historic Commission, they've gone out and purchased new experts to give their opinions. Um, I don't really care what's going on in Milton, Quincy, or Needham um, on totally different plots of land than the plot of land right here on, on Prospect Street and State Street. Um, and I'm asking the planning board uh, to bring this to a vote tonight to end this, uh, you know, move it forward or, or back. Um, we've, all, we've all been through this too long and they're not gonna listen to any other uh, comments. And I, and I think we just need to move this forward. Um, I would ask the planning board to vote no on this proposal as it is. Um, and I, I thank you for your patience and your, your unbiased help throughout this whole process. Um, Attorney Mead brought up some, some comments about time and how long we're here and how long the bank's been here. Uh, my, my house has been around uh, 20, 30 years before the bank was incorporated uh, and maybe 70 years before uh, the bank had their structure on, on State Street. Um, you know, so please try to keep other historical structures in mind when you're making your decision. Also, um, some comments have Two been minutes. made tonight about the brevity of how long people stay in the neighborhood. Um, my daughter is nine years old. She's lived here her whole life. This is the only house she knows. Uh, this is the only street she knows in the neighborhood. So I thank you for your consideration. Um, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, next person we have uh, raised hand is Gary Corrales. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> well, my name is Gary Corrales. I own the properties at 15, 17, 19, 21 Prospect Street. I don't, I've written a number of letters before, all of which are on file. I don't think we know who, if any of the neighbors, have spoken in favor of this proposal. We constantly hear from Lisa Mead about other neighborhoods, Harris Street, Middle Street, and Essex Street. She has talked about the bank having the right to grow. But what about the effect on the abutters? Do any of the employees, trustees, or vendors doing business with the bank live in the neighborhood? They have spoken in favor, yet they do not live in the area and are paid by the bank. Corporators of the bank have also spoken in favor. Planning board member Rick Tainter has said a number of times that the addition is out of context with its surroundings. It has also been said before, but I need to reiterate the words that the scale and mass are too big, too tall and too much. This still remains a problem of public vehicles getting around the already congested area, such as trash haulers, fire equipment and snow removal trucks. I thank the planning board for hearing us and I ask them to reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of hands raised here. I just want to check. Uh, Cindy Johnson, I, I believe you spoke earlier. Am I not correct about that? You have your hand raised, but. No, I, I, it doesn't show that it's raised on my screen. No, I'm done. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, thank you. Just want to be sure. Um, and uh, Chris Skiba, I think, I uh, just want to confirm as well. You've, you've spoken previously. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so at, at this point, uh, Chair, we do have um, no hands raised other than Jim Poulin, who unfortunately seems to be having an audio issue uh, that we cannot seem to resolve or he's not able to resolve. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you to everybody who's spoken. I will close the public comment portion of this hearing and um, go to the planning board members for their response to what they've heard and seen. Um, I'd like all planning board members to please unmute in advance so we can move quickly from one member to another. Let me just remind you that this is a different um, re uh, request from what we're going to do later. Um, we will come back again um, and look at the criteria um, that we have to review for the permits before us. So this is just asking for planning board members' response to um, what they've heard and seen so far. And after that, um, we'll have an opportunity to hear from the applicant before we go into the detailed review. Um, who would like to go first? Uh, Chair Sontag, if I may. Uh, this is well, I was gonna wait um, for you until before we speak about the, um, the specifics of the review. Would that be more appropriate for your time or would you like to speak now. Uh, if it's right, I'd like to get my comments now, but whatever. Okay, whatever you fine, fine. I knew you wanted to speak, so if you want to do it now, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, the board has to make a decision on this application, of course, um, but uh, it just felt it necessary to comment uh, with a little bit of context. Um, so I, I just, as I give my comments, I just want to uh, throw up on the screen here an aerial photograph and a zoning map for the area where this project is sited. Um, and I just wanted to um, have folks uh, keep that in mind in context, I guess. Um, and I apologize because I have to do these these uh, things multitasking. But uh, so this this is an aerial photograph of of where the property falls, right in the uh, in the district. There, the property itself is highlighted. Um, what I'm switching to here is that same map, but uh, it's a little harder to read. But it shows the zoning district. So if you could just keep that in mind. Um, I read these, these comments. Um, as the map shows, the subject property is located at the transition between the business and residential zoning. And I would emphasize that the subject property and others abutting it fall entirely within the underlying business district in which the zoning ordinance continues to allow greater height than is proposed by the applicant here and the zero lot line setbacks, though not proposed here by the applicant. This is presumably to ensure the vitality, appropriate build out and active frontage so essential to a vibrant downtown. Newburyport's downtown is relatively small and I believe it is important to balance the purposes of our equally important business zone and district 
but the local historic district style design review process called for here in the downtown overlay district. I believe design and conceptual review within the downtown is necessary, but do not believe that two story infill within the downtown business district is inherently detrimental to the historic architectural context we have here, business or residential, often intermingled at the fringes as we see here. This is also common an element uh, and a common aspect of our downtown land uses in the historical architectural context. This coexistence, not necessarily conflict, can be found at other locations where the downtown transitions into dense residential neighborhoods. With all this in mind, it does not seem unreasonable in review of this project to interpret the DOD and the Secretary's guidelines as they are contained or referenced in the Newburyport Zoning Ordinance. Uh, to necessarily contemplate and allow for continued coexistence at the transition between our downtown business district and the dense abutting residential neighborhoods, both of which provide important context to the review of this project and the scale and massing of proposed structures. While I am not an expert in the Secretary's guidelines, I am not persuaded that the addition proposed here is a detriment to the historic integrity of the original bank building, given its distance at the rear of the site. And while I agree that the surrounding neighborhood provides important context that must be reviewed for similar impacts, it seems important to remember that the underlying business district, current zoning and or historical built forms also provide an important context that should be considered when evaluating appropriate scale and massing for this project. The applicant has made several design changes in an effort to address concerns raised at previous public hearings. They claim to have exhausted all architectural options to lower the roof and eave height structurally. The most recent criticism we heard focused on an approximately 18 inch difference between the compared uh, average surrounding eave heights, some of which were in the adjacent residential district where lower roof heights are both expected and required. In tonight's application, the applicant proposes changes to the architectural detailing in response to the comments made by board members at the prior hearing night. As I understand it, they do not believe the height or size of the building can be reduced any further while meeting other project and zoning requirements. Although this business addition does not abut resident, does abut residential properties, given its location entirely within the business district and in recognition of the common areas of transition we have uh, in other areas of the downtown, it does not seem unreasonable to me to accept this 18 inch difference as, a, as comparable and not detrimental. I have no objection to the use of brick, a commonly used material for structures within the subject business district. However, if collaborative siding somehow returns to design plans, I have no objection to that treatment either. Both appear to have contextual relevance at this location. If the revisions made by the applicant this evening are not sufficient to address board concerns, I recommend that board members clarify what changes are necessary to address their outstanding concerns and whether that be of size and scale or more detailed elements. I realize this may be difficult to do as a nine member board, but reaching general consensus will be helpful to all in lieu of numerous potentially conflicting requests or expectations. To be clear, it is the planning board's sole discretion based on input from all stakeholders, whether to approve or reject these plans. And the board does have broad discretion to determine if required findings and standards are met. Recognizing the extensive time this board, the applicant and other interested parties have spent during the past year on a sometimes controversial project, I hope the board and applicant are approaching a reasonable place of compromise regarding scale and massing in light of the regulations and application of the guidelines in the context provided by our architectural heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'll, I'll now take general comments from um, members of the planning board from what you've heard and seen so far. Mm -hmm. Money, uh, it's Don. I'll go first if um, if uh, that's okay with you. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, a couple of thoughts I have. First of all, I want to know if the counselor, or, or, um, who's present at this, would mind repeating, if that's okay, what he said at the last meeting with respect to the objective or the goal or the duty of the planning board. Uh, when I listen, and as some of you may know, I was not at the last meeting, uh, the public hearing, but I did listen to the audio um, video actually in full. But I, I did have a question with respect to, is there an obligation for us to work uh, to get a yes vote? It, as compared to, is it our duty to hear all the facts and at the end of the day, with respect to all the facts and, and whatever findings we make, either approve or dis, disapprove. I'm, I'm happy to clarify that question or comment uh, later. 
It seems to me with respect to the historical content of it, we've got our historical commission has, has made the recommendations and to me, they've been fairly consistent. And I've also heard from the applicants, uh, historic uh, experts. And um, again, I think they've been fairly consistent. And I think it's fair to say there is a, uh, a chasm between the two. And it seems to me that no matter what we do, we're not going to get any compromise, even if we hypothetically hired an independent third party, I'm not sure where we're going to be. So I, I just say that as a, as a fact or, or a finding that I, I don't see anything. I, I do think that the experts by the, by the plaintiff are probably, not a probably, they are, have better credentials. They're, they're professionals. On the other hand, I'm not being cynical, nor am I uh, disparaging the professionalism of the applicants uh, consultants, one could possibly say, well, they're being paid by then, and so perhaps there is a certain implicit uh, bias. With respect to the butters, I think it's been very consistent. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure we need to have many more of these meetings, if any, because uh, it's, it's very clear. And on the other hand, I think that the, the bank has, has made some modifications. I appreciate that the modifications are, are not as substantial as, as the abutters and or perhaps the planning board um, has wanted. I also understand that, you know, I, my guess is they're looking for the bank to make these changes as compared to the planning board or the abutters say, look, we want a building that is only one story or fit in this footprint. So I can appreciate, um, you know, who takes the first step, so to speak. In any event, these are really just my, my thoughts uh, at this particular point. And personally, as, as we continue, uh, during this meeting, I'm, I'm personally prepared to uh, make a vote and or close the public hearing and move forward on this. Thank you. Don, let me just respond to um, your first question, your only question. Um, working to yes doesn't mean that we have to come to a decision that is yes. The idea is that we're working toward a point where we can agree with the applicant with all the facts and all of the input so that we can try to find a way to say yes, but it's not required that we come to a yes decision. Does that answer your question? Not really, but that's okay. Well, I'm trying to clarify it so that there's no question left dangling. Well, be because I, I think you're always going to have a difference of opinion between the applicant and the, um, and, and the planning board uh, on the facts. They're, they're not necessarily black and white, they're not binary. Well, I'm not saying that everybody is gonna to agree to everything, but the yes I'm talking about is that we want to approve applications if they meet the criteria in the zoning, part of the zoning that we are reviewing under. I, I guess it so again, we Bonnie's we probably- We are not required to push and push and push until we finally you know, get the applicant to move in our direction or vice versa. It, it has to come together. And if it doesn't come together, then when the vote is taken, it could be a, uh, a negative vote. See what I mean? No, I do. And I may be splitting hairs and it may be syntax. When you said the, the planning board wants to make a yes decision, I think the planning board, again, if all the all the facts and findings are consistent with the, with our zoning, then then it's not we want, we, we should, we must. Right make it conform. So that, and again, it's, it's perhaps just a play of words. So thanks again, Bonnie. Okay. So we'll move on to um, another planning board member's um, response to what you've heard and seen. And if you, again, if you could uh, unmute yourself in advance, we can move right along, along almost like we are face-to-face. -face. No other comments? I'll make something like Okay. Um, so, and this is actually not so much in response to the design, but more about the process to date. And I would, I would say that the most honest argument in favor of the application, and one we've heard at every meeting, I think, is that the Institution for Savings is a valuable and valued business that Newburyport oh. residents should support. And I agree with this, and I don't think anyone in Newburyport would argue or disagree with this. And I think that the bank should be able to expand on this site 
And I wish they could come up with a plan that does a better job of meeting the purposes of our zoning ordinance. But this argument is really irrelevant to the issues that have been raised about the application. And the subtext seems to be that the bank deserves special consideration, that its value to the community preempts the purposes and criteria that the planning board is supposed to consider. And I would say that the most dishonest argument in favor of the bank's plan is the suggestion that any criticism of any particular development plan represents opposition to business expansion on the property or that is meant to send a message that businesses aren't welcome in the downtown. In my case, that is absolutely untrue. And I suspect that the people who make such statements know that it's untrue, but they're just trying to um, make us make a, the strongest case they can. The downtown overlay district was established, was overlaid on the underlying zoning districts to modify the criteria of those districts and in part to protect the surrounding properties regardless of what underlying districts they are in. But if economic development is the primary objective, then maybe the city council should repeal the downtown overlay district or amend it so that the board can ignore certain zoning criteria if they get in the way of, it, get in the way of an important project. Now getting to this plan specifically, I think attorney Meade would like to pick and choose which aspects of historic context are valuable and which are really disposable. The plan argues in favor of maintaining a 1970s parking lot and a modernistic reinterpretation of a clock tower combined with a fountain. Regardless of the architectural details, the site plan, and, I, and I'm, I'm looking at it from the site plan position rather than in the location of, of development on the site rather than the skin of the building. But the site plan is in no way convincingly contextual but instead seems arbitrary and random. It just places where, you, where you've got a, a downtown streetscape, and I've, I've said it before, and I know people don't like me to say it, but where you've got a downtown streetscape that really needs to be filled in. The historic context of the bank was that you couldn't see the side of the bank if you came up State Street uh, because there were there were buildings there, and I, you know, I think that this is a very the picture we have in front of us is a very modern, non-historic um, layout of the site. And I think that the, uh, you know, it's, that really hasn't been seriously considered as far as I can tell. So we've always looked at putting the building back among the residences and leaving this 1970s parking lot here. You know, down when Newburyport was down on its luck, um, the, I think up until the 1970s, there was a lot of demolition that happened and, and knocked down a lot of historic buildings to create parking lots. Uh, I'm not sure that this, the buildings that were here were knocked down in the 1970s or not, but that was what happened down on Unicorn Street and the Green Street parking lot and so forth. And I'm not sure that's really the land use pattern that we should be promoting in, in our historic community. And I just like to close by saying, I don't think this is an all or nothing situation. I really think that there's room on the site to expand, to fill in this, this uh, missing tooth on the, on the commercial streetscape and, and that way have less impact on the neighborhood. I, I don't have a sense at this point which way I'm going to vote on this. Um, obviously, I'm going to wait to hear more from other members of the board. But I, I really have I have um, I have some resentment about the way that our attitudes have been have been characterized by some of the speakers, and I, I do think that all of the board members have been looking at this very carefully and um, and would like to come to a, a a solution that we're all happy with. And it's difficult because there's so many uh, conflicting, um, conflicting uh, interests here. And that's all I'll say at this point. Thank you, Rick. Bonnie, this is Tanya. Yes, Tanya, hello. Um, I just would like to, <clears throat> again, speak in, in support of the project. Um, I, I think that the, project meets the, the zoning um, ordinance as Andy laid out. Um, I think the applicant has, has done a good job of listening to us, even though I know that the comments have, have varied um, and I appreciate that. I also agree that it does meet, um, that, that I agree with the opinion on the Secretary of Interior standards that have been laid out. And, um, and so that's all I, that's, that's all I have to add. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to go next. Um, I'm um, 
I'm glad to see the improvements that have been made and identified by Attorney Mead. I don't need to repeat them here, but I do want to say that I'm disappointed that the applicant hasn't found a way to lower the eave line and thus, thus reduce the massiveness of the structure, because obviously if they reduced the eave line, they would have to uh, redesign it in some way. The plans show a reduced roof ridge height, but not a reduced eave height from previous proposals. And I believe Attorney Mead did speak to that point earlier this evening. But from the street level, the eave height is more visible, and that's why I want to focus on it. Um, I'd hope that the applicant would alter their use plan, otherwise known as programming, which I know we have no authority over, but they do, or submit an acceptable alternative parking arrangement for the equivalent of one level of parking so that they could reduce the building in that way or propose a building design which would allow them to lower the height in some other way, but they have not. And also reflecting Rick and others' comments, the applicant has not been willing to consider in any serious way the idea of placing a structure on the corner of state and prospect, which would remove a good portion of the addition from the residential neighborhood and position it as a contemporary addition to the historic bank building, which would definitely be within the um, standards from the Secretary of the Interior for an, a, a new addition. Uh, something else that came up as I was reviewing these plans um, that I haven't brought up before, and I imagine the applicant could respond to it, and that has to do with um, causing more congestion on Prospect Street by queuing to enter the stacked parking in the garage um, that would um, potentially overflow into the ad adjacent streets, most likely to occur at the start and the end of the workday. Because of that stacking system, it may take longer to get those cars off the street. So those are my general comments at this point, and I um, would like to call on any other member who's ready to speak at this time. Um, I'll, I'll go by. Um, That's Leah, right? Yeah, this is Leah. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm I'm I I I've been racking my brains, and I I think I get my head straight on on how to approach this project, and and then Rick speaks, and <laughs> um, everything Rick says resonates with me, and um, to 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 the to his comment about how um, the institution. Um, and their team has spoken about some of our comments and, and, and distorted some of them and picked and picked and chosen some of, of you know, the, the letter of the law to, to um, talk about and not others. Um, but, but mostly it's the, um, when looked at this holistically, we can, we can um, argue dimensions and bringing it down the height down one foot and pushing this wall back a little bit and pushing that a, another. Um, I think it's gotten the plan to a really good place. I think that visually it almost feels like it fits and it almost feels like it's a nice balance between the residential and the institutional. Um, I feel like they do have a right to build on this location on this site if they want to. But then Rick says so eloquently that where it should be is on State Street and it just, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not quite sure which way I would vote on it right now, but my goodness, if only um, we had an opportunity to see what it would have looked like on State Street, it seems like that would have alleviated so much of the difficulties that we've had in trying to get to yes. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. can go next. This is MJ. Um, I guess for me, it comes down to somewhat of also what Rick is talking about and, and the idea of looking at surface lots. So no one right really likes to look at surface lots. Surface lots are ugly. Right now we have one hidden in the back um, off of State Street. And I'll go back to the idea that, you know, right now, even when you look from State Street at this new potential addition, what do you see? You see a surface lot before you see the building. And I'd rather see a building that interacts with State Street than a surface lot. 
And I want to also, uh, Andy brought up something about the, um, the, the active street front that, that they're creating is on prospect. And I, I think, again, that's incorrect. I think it should be on State Street. And the, and the residents don't want the active part of this in their neighborhood as much. Um, and then I guess, finally, I'd just like to say that there's a number of these bank fronts with surface lots in the back. And I'd hate to see all of them become infill parking lots to um, accommodate more employees. Um, I don't think that's a good trend for the city. And then finally, I'll just go back to the massing. I don't care about the height of this or the roof line of that. It's just massive. The whole piece is just massive in this site. And if you look at that aerial view, it just still feels like it's taking up um, the wrong part of the bit, the, the wrong part of the lot. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Bonnie? Yes? Uh, this is Ann. Oh, sure, um, sure. Ann. Yeah. <clears throat> At our last meeting, when when the bank uh, presented uh, the revised plans, um, I was very excited because I think for me, for the first time, I saw a significant change, and I did see reduction in massing. Um, very much liked what they did with the landscaping. I th I think it was a a great step. I guess my disappointment tonight was, was perhaps I was hoping for an equally significant um, reduction yet again. Um, I guess when you look at you know, our criteria, especially under special permit, um, what I'm still stuck on is I think it would impair the character and integrity of the adjoining district. I think if the proposal meets all the requirements of the business district, and that's, that's not an issue for me. Uh, I am certainly not an anti-business person by any means, um, but I, I continue to be very concerned about changing the historic character of the residential neighborhood, not only for the people who live there today, but for all the future generations who live in that, that neighborhood. Um, I think many of us maybe reg regret that we didn't pay more attention to Rick's State Street uh, thinking a year ago, because I think he did bring that up a year ago. And the more I come back to that, the more I think it would solve a lot of problems, especially my primary one, which is impacting the adjoining um, residential neighborhood. So um, those are my thoughts. Um, I, I, I think, you know, without a significant change, either moving the building or shrinking it yet again. Um, it's time to vote and move on. I, you know, <laughs> the bank's tired, the neighborhood's tired, I'm tired. You know, if, if this is the final product, I'm certainly ready to um, vote on it. Thank you, Ann. I'll go ahead and speak, Bonnie, for um, I, I wish that we could get to something that the Historical Commission could agree is in keeping with the standards and we could all be pretty clear and confident that um, the project would meet the DOD standards and the site plan review criteria. Um, but I am still concerned about the size, um, the massing. I mean, it, it's enormous in that 
lot. Um, and I, I know the architects have done everything they can to break it up, but I, I feel like it can't, it does not fit in um, as far as size, mass, um, height into the neighborhood, into the lot where it's located um, and into its setting with the DOD. I also am concerned that it uh, overwhelms the historic building. Um, even if I consider the 1980s edition, uh, with that being so small, this looks maybe even larger. Um, so I definitely am still concerned about the massing um, and the size. Uh, I think I have, you know, asked whether the bank could consider renovating existing space in order to have a smaller addition, um, putting some of the parking off site. I know, you know, Lisa has indicated that everybody was up in arms when they proposed the 32 um, parking spaces off site, but I think there's some sort of middle ground between all the parking on site and any additional parking um, being all the additional parking being off site. I think there's a spectrum um, that maybe the bank could consider whether they can have some of the parking on site and some of the parking off site in order to um, reduce the size of the structure. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at the Sanborn maps um, and sort of the historic documentation around the site. And it was residential. This was part of, there were dwellings on this property historically. That's what the historic land use pattern was. There was eventually a garage that was further towards, the, towards State Street. Um, this was historically a residential neighborhood. And it, I think that is sort of in keeping with the way that the city is set up. There are these juxtapositions between brick buildings and wood clad buildings. But in this area, as you go up State Street and as you go um, towards Federal Street, there are fewer of those situations. Um, so, I mean, I know this is own business. I'm not saying that I don't think the bank should develop it as a business um, or as a commercial site, but I do think that the size and the mass needs to be more comparable and um, yeah, more compatible with the neighborhood. So those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks Beth. So all the planning board members have spoken if I've calculated correctly. So I'm gonna give um, Attorney Mead um, on behalf of the applicant the opportunity to speak now or to wait until, until after, after we've, um, we've reviewed the special permit and site plan criteria or at both times. What is your preference, Attorney Mead? I think I would definitely like to um, speak now, um, but not give up my right to address any questions during the uh, review of the criteria. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I certainly appreciate everybody's um, comments. I do wanna, I, I have a, a number of things to say. Um, the first of which is that the bank, as the applicant, has never asked for special treatment. Um, there are a number of people in the community that have supported the bank and have indicated that the bank, because of its history, should certainly have um, be that should be taken. Into but the bank, as applicant, has always uh, put forth the criteria and shown how they meet the criteria. Um, the next thing is relative to um, the parking. We are resolving the parking on site because that's what the zoning ordinance requires. Um, we are not going to take a special um, permit and try to reduce the parking on site. That was, that was clearly 
a, um, a problem with the neighborhood and the bank tried to address that issue. I want to significantly address the issue about putting the addition on State Street. Um, as I said earlier, and as Rick acknowledged, as did several of members, this issue came up in August and was dismissed by the board. I went back and reviewed the minutes. And now at the 11th hour, it's becoming intriguing. Well, let me tell you a couple of reasons why it's not intriguing to the bank. A, as I said in my initial presentation, it would have to be connected to the original structure and it would block the most prominent part of the, of the original structure as, it, as you come up state street. Uh, maybe Mr. Eichmann could um, mute his mic because I think there's a... a, a The next part of that issue is that um, if the bank were to locate a building at the front of the property, that all of the traffic that visits the bank would go down Prospect Street, both to enter the bank property and to leave the bank property. And they would then go through the Otis Garden Street neighborhood, as well as Prospect Street, Fair Street, Federal Street. And that absolutely would impact the neighborhood. All of the traffic that goes to the bank, employees, customers, and visitors would come in off a of prospect and leave from prospect. And there's only one way to leave from prospect and that's through the neighborhood. And it doesn't work. And the bank is not interested in it. They're not interested in another full on redesign because it doesn't accomplish their business purpose and it's actually not better for the neighborhood. The next thing I would like to address is the issue about impairing the integrity of the adjoining district. This is, as Andy suggested in his comments, this is a standard land use pattern in the B2 zoning district. We don't have, and I have said this on numerous, numerous occasions, the zoning ordinance doesn't have a transition. We have hard transitions. It's the B2, then it's the residential. And in this instance, yes, um, Ms. Delisle is correct. There, are, there, was, there were residences at the rear of this property at one time, actually a couple of multifamily residences and maybe a single a long, long time ago, but it's now the business district and there are residents that are still there. And the business district absent the DOD allows full build out on their property. And so the, the, city, uh, the city council acknowledged in their adoption of the DOD, these unique land use patterns in the downtown overlay district and the B2 district. They're hard transitions. It is what it is. It's why people move to the area, it's urban. People move here because it's urban and you can walk places and you're right next to businesses. It exists all over the DOD, all over the DOD. This is not unique. All of a sudden we're changing how we're doing land use patterns in the downtown. I have to tell you, I am very concerned as a downtown business owner and a longtime resident of this city that we're talking about not encouraging development behind existing buildings and businesses in the downtown, those comments were frightening to me. Having the, been the mayor of the city and worried about the constant economic survival of the businesses in the downtown districts, which, which generate tax revenue and jobs for the people of this city, those comments were frightening. So the bank's not interested in moving the building forward on State Street. They have spent an enormous amount of money to get to this design and to try to address as many concerns as they could of the board and the neighbors while still have a program which meets their needs and which provides the parking requirements that they, um, that they have. And so 
At this point, I would like to just um, turn it over one moment to Christopher, who has a comment um, related to some of the comments that were given by the boards, and then um, we'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm very struck by a lot of the comments and, you know, the number of comments that we've heard. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to take my architect hat off for a second, but because I think, I think what's difficult for me to listen to as a designer is the, the discussion about size and how it relates to program and hearing how disappointed the, the planning board members are that program can't just be changed, you know, at, on a whim. And I, I thought I'd try to make a, an impassioned argument by flipping the narrative a little bit and saying, if you could imagine there was an empty lot in a residential neighborhood and that empty lot by right allowed for a 2,500 square foot wood frame home and someone bought that property and they went through a huge amount of effort to design a home. Let's say it was 2,300 square feet. It had four bedrooms. And in the approval process, someone said, you know, it's just too big. The other buildings around are so much smaller. It's too big. It's too big for the area. And that homeowner now was asked to go from a four bedroom house to a two bedroom house or a three bedroom house because of the approval process, a bunch of, there was a lot of opinion about, about size. And I, I think this is where as a designer, there, there's, it's hard to understand how, when we're talking about things like massing, that size and massing are, they are connected of course, but massing is a modification of size. Massing is, massing is a way of, of modulating size. And, and so this, this idea that program equals size equals mass equals something that's not acceptable, even though it fits within the envelope, I, I, I can't express how hard it is as a designer to hear these comments and put them into a logical, actionable set of statements. And I, I would really love, you know, I, I really love we were all sitting around a table, truthfully, because I think if we were sitting around a table looking at each other, this coming together could happen. We could get our language straight and we can understand what's happening behind those windows and walls and all these things we seem to care about, even though every, every criteria is being met. And, you know, I, I think if, I, I, I think it would be great if the board could, could come to some understanding that the program is not just something you, you, you can just decide to lop off another 30% and make it all better. That's, that's not the way pr programming works. It's a design, it's a criteria for acceptance of, of the project existing at all. Just like if I buy a house, a property and put a house on it, my, my criteria is I needed a four bedroom house and now I'm being told I can only buy, build a two, then that property is worthless to me. So I, I'm hoping that we can continue that conversation and, and, and get rid of this idea that, 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 that a, a building that fits within the criteria envelope that we're given to design within has has some fault in it because e not even at the program I, I don't, I'm not sure what's causing this but but the program fits within the criteria given and so how are we supposed to react to that I, I, I wanted to try to appeal to this idea of size which just keeps on coming up and still is is an incredibly difficult thing to understand. Thank you for your comments. I'm assuming that um, concludes applicant comments for this point in time. Is that I, I, correct? I, I, Madam Chair, I just want to add one other thing. If you, Andy, yeah. if you could put a slide 45.
This slide looks down um, Prospect Street. And I think what's important about this slide is, you know, we, in a planning process, uh, we look at these um, bird's eye views. And nobody in real life looks at bird's eye views unless you operate a drone for a living. Um, and most of us, I suspect, around this table, so to speak, don't operate a drone. So this is the view and this is the quote size and height as compared to the adjacent structures on the opposite side of the street. This isn't a structure that's immediately next to it. It's on the opposite side of the street. This is the perception. And this is what Christopher and all of us were trying to say is that as you walk down the street, and see this structure, given the changes in the structure, it is not different than the eave line and the roof line from the structures on the opposite side of the street. And I just think, or even this bay window that's immediately in front of you on the left. And so I, I think that it's just really important to see it from this view and to remember as you're looking at this project that this project isn't going to be experienced from the air it's going to be experienced from the street. And that's how we're gonna see it, whether we're going this way down Prospect Street or if you went back up to an earlier slide that shows the opposite direction on Prospect Street. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, um, we will uh, continue our review in a more specific way, um, looking at first the DOD special permit criteria then the general special permit criteria, and finally site plan review. Um, we will look at only the highlighted sections, which Andy is going to put on the screen. Um, if board members wanna comment on any other criteria that you're perfectly welcome to, but these are the ones that are uh, most pertinent to um, the application that have not been, um, have been under consideration over this um, extended period of um, public hearings. Uh, I'd like to give a um, introduction to the review of the criteria before we get going. Uh, the planning board works with each special permit applicant to reach a compromise that the applicant abutters and other interested parties can live with. We live in a community where residents and business owners share a deep concern for our historically significant built environment. In fact, that's the very reason why the city council adopted the downtown overlay district or DOD. The multiple meetings, the outpouring of public comment and the due diligence of the historical commission attest to the commitment of the community members to work with the institution for savings to build an addition that will fit in this historic location. The DOD authorizes the planning board as the special permit granting authority to evaluate an application based on the underlying zoning as well as the provisions of the DOD. But when there is any conflict, the um, DOD takes precedence. In addition, this application requires approval under site plan review. Um, the planning board will consider all of these um, sections for both ordinances. I wanna refer um, to a statement by attorney Eichmann from our last meeting and he may want to clarify it because I may not be as clear as he was. And it has to do with how we view, we planning board members view and talk about um, the criteria. By the way, Andy, I would like to start with the DOD criteria if you could go down to those while I'm still speaking. Um, so, uh, when we discuss massing and size, Attorney Eichmann said, we should not focus on whether massing and sca scale are appropriate for use in the neighborhood, but whether the massing and scale are appropriate for the standards of this special permit, i.e. compatibility with existing historic buildings and the historic character of the district. These are similar considerations, but not exactly the same standard. Um, Attorney Eichmann, can you 
confirm or clarify what um, I've just interpreted as your statement giving us guidance on how to review these criteria. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Attorney Eichmann. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I thought um, you said that well. I would not change that. That would be my primary um, advice to the board. Um, the DOD special permit focuses on the historic character of the district and the buildings within it. I think the standards, the criteria, and specifically when I talk about criteria, I'm thinking about the criteria in section five of the ordinance, which applies to new construction and alterations. Um, um, that, that criteria must be read in the context of the historical character of the buildings in the district. And I think the first sentence you see there in 5A is, and it, I think it's the overall standard for the a special permit in this district, new construction alterations must be compatible with existing historic buildings and structures within the DOD. It's followed by a colon, and then there are further standards, which I think are within the envelope that's established by that existing, that first standard. Um, so again, the focus, I think, even with massing, with size, obviously a key element here has to be taken um, in the context of how does that fit within the is it compatible with existing historic buildings and structures or in the DOD? Um, that would be my focus, regardless of how the board votes on this. I think the board needs, should pay careful attention to um, coming up with factual findings to support its vote, referencing the criteria in this section. Great, thank you very much. So board members, um, please, if it, if it, uh, would you please comment specifically to um, uh, this criterion for um, the DOD special permit? Bonnie, uh, this is Rick. Um, yeah. This is, this is actually the, the this, this paragraph, causes a lot of difficulty, I think, because the first sentence of it, which Attorney Eichmann quoted, seems like it is the basic criterion, right? So new construction alterations must be compatible with existing historic buildings and structures within the DOD. So that tells me that we don't look at the boundary of the business district, we look across the street to the residential district. Uh, then it adds some more sentences that, that seem to confuse the issue. Um, it talks about the subject historic building structure, the lot where it is located, or it's setting within the DOD. Now, it's setting within the DOD probably does refer to other structures within the DOD. But it, if it hadn't, it's, it's unfortunate that, they, that the, the language isn't consistent, that, the, that the, the basic criterion says structures within the DOD, and then the subsequent sentences say it's setting within the DOD. Um, you know, I think it would be much stronger if it had, didn't have the remaining sentences to it, but I think they kind of um, fuzzy up the, uh, the analysis. Um, but I do think that this, so, so Attorney Mead talked about the fact that we don't have a transition district. I think the DOD is meant to function as a transition district. I think it's meant to say, when you have these hard districts butting up against each other, as she, as she described it, the, the hard boundaries, you use the DOD to try to soften that boundary and recognize the impact on the abutting properties. So I, I think this, this paragraph is clearly the, the, the nub of, of, of our task here is to look at this and say, is this um, development um, uh, compatible with the uh, smaller structures surrounding it on three sides. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just stop there for now. Well, do you have a, a comment about whether or not it meet the proposal meets the criteria described here? Well, as I say, it's difficult. I, you know, my, my sense is that it doesn't, but I'm 
you know, there are other people on the board who have <clears throat> training with, you know, specialized training with in terms of design that I, I would, would certainly want to listen to. Um, and, you know, just getting back to the, um, the, uh, the comments by the architect, uh, you know, comparing this to a, a vacant single family lot, this is not the same situation. This is a situation where we don't have a cut and dry set of criteria to work with. It is all uh, judgment call and, and um, analysis and trying to figure out how we can make things work better. So my sense, my, my, my sense now is that it, it wouldn't comply, but um, I'm, I'm willing to, to hear. Okay, fine. The reason why I'm pushing, and this is for everybody else's comments as well, from the discussion we're having right now and the review of these criteria will come the findings for the decision um, that will be written up um, following whenever we take a vote. So as specific and um, as clear as you can be would be very helpful um, ultimately to Andy and Caitlin who will be writing up um, the decision. To pick up a little bit on what Rick says it's to, and to, to finesse some of the, the, the difficulty in this one sentence even further is the word compatible. Um, what does it mean to be compatible? How compatible should it be? And we're talking about a residential structure versus an institutional structure. How do those two things become compatible? Does it mean that one has to be just like the other? Um, I don't know the answer to that. So, I mean, Rick referenced um, designers um, perspective on this and I, I happen to be one. And um, I think in many ways it is compatible, in many ways it isn't. And I think in, to some extent, the distinction from the residential is an important distinction. Um, and, and so it does come back to general size and massing, but how it, can those two be slightly distinct also, like some other larger buildings are downtown from the smaller residential structures that they abut? That's all. Uh, Bonnie, this is uh, Don. With respect to uh, fitting with the area, uh, it really is twofold. One is the residential that uh, has already been spoken to, and the other is the commercial side. You know, it, it actually is zoned commercial, downtown, et cetera. And so we have this juxtaposition, in my opinion. And for the time being, if you, you want a, a uh, again, a, a, a binary answer. I, I say at this point that uh, it, it, it does satisfy that finding. Bonnie, this is Tanya and I'll concur with Don's opinion on this. And, and, and I will throw out that, that I, I think um, the more I think about it and the, the state streets issue aside, which pains me if this this um, if we have to close the door on that as an opportunity but state street issue aside I, I I think we have reached a certain compatibility that I am comfortable with okay I'll go next um, this is Bonnie I rec I'm going to talk to new construction first and then compatibility um, I recognize that the addition is new construction and as such doesn't need to mimic any other structures in the overlay district, but it is, is new construction on a site with a historic structure within a historic district. So the proposed addition should contribute to preserving and not detract from the historic character of the overlay district, which includes, as others have said, commercial and residential structures. Um, this addition could, could fulfill both requirements if it were designed on a scale that is subordinate to the existing historic structure on the site and at or below an average eave height of the abutting historic structures. So um, the Historical Commission has reinforced um, this view, especially in their January 28th report and um, state and show that neither standard has been met. So I'm, I'm agreeing with them. I don't think the standard has been met on uh, new construction. For compatibility, returning to brick positions the addition as a continuation of the historic structure 
and even its 1980 edition. In that scenario, I'd like to go back to what um, Patricia Pecknick said at the uh, our previous meeting on February 17th. Um, and I quote her here, I believe. If the edition can be reduced in size so it doesn't read as a separate structure, if it's height and massing are reduced so that it reads as an addition and not as a second building, then she agreed that the brick is appropriate histori historical I idiom. And I agree with her. Um, throughout the city and specifically in the downtown, we have lots of examples of commercial and um, residential uh, buildings next to each other. We've talked about this already, so I'll gloss over that. Um, but say that on this site, I agree with the other um, board members who have said historically, this site has had a combination of residential and um, commercial buildings, two on um, State Street. One was right next to the bank, was a um, clabbered building, and the one next to that was a um, either brick or brownstone. And then coming down Prospect, there was, as um, someone mentioned, a, a garage up at that end, and then farther down, a clapboard um, boarding house. I don't know when they were um, taken down, but clearly that was the context in which the building, the bank um, was constructed and operated in. And I believe the context matters. I have no problem with the brick structure, but without lowering the eave height, to at least the level of the wings on the historic structure and adjusting the design of the addition accordingly, I believe the massing of this structure is not subordinate to the historic bank, nor is it compatible with the abutting historical residential structures in the neighborhood as required by the, his, by the Secretary of the Interior's standards. Um, so I don't think it meets the, this criteria. Would anyone else like to speak to this? Um, I, I will. I, I guess I pretty much agree with Bonnie, and I just feel that um, I'm not sure it's the DOD that we're answering to as much as it is the um, SOI, whatever it's called. Um, but it, it's it's that the subordinate part. I don't feel like the structure is subordinate, and I and I don't know if this is the right place for that comment in the DOD as much as it is um, in another part of what we, uh, the guidelines we need to follow. But I feel like that's the most important thing that I'd still like to focus on is that this building is not subordinate at all to um, the existing structures on the site. I'll go ahead, Bonnie. Um, I agree with Bonnie and MJ. Um, and I do think, you know, Rick is right that if it stopped at, that it would be compatible with existing historic buildings and structures within the DOD, then, you know, the fact that there are other situations like this in the DOD somewhere would mean that we could say this was compatible. But I think when you look more specifically at the more specific language where it discusses the lot where it's located and its setting within the DOD that we need to take its setting individually um, where the actual lot is located. Um, and so while I agree that the brick is could be compatible, um, the color could be compatible. Um, I do think that the size and the scale and the height are not compatible with A, the historic building, um, but also the lot and its setting in the DOD. Yes, I would just agree with uh, Bonnie, MJ, and Beth on that analysis. So we heard from everybody on this item and does anyone want to speak again on it?
Okay. Let's move on, Andy, please, to general uh, special permit findings. They're back up somewhere in the document. And the highlighted piece on here, the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts, nor be detrimental to the health or welfare. Um, everything else seems to have been um, met on these, uh, this list of criteria. Any further clarification um, or reference from what you've already said to this um, special permit finding? I just would like to clarify um, with attorney Eichmann. So this special permit findings reference the requested use. So are we to take the use generally or this specific project that has been proposed? Like the, the general use of banking or service industry or whatever, um, is that what we're supposed to be considering or are we supposed to be considering this actual project as proposed? Is that clear? It is through you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can respond to that. Um, I think in this case, uh, the requested use is the historical structure in its context in the district. It is not a reference in this particular situation to the use, the commercial use of the property. Uh, the ordinance has already decided that, that use is allowed as a right. I think this has to be read as referencing the use that's allowed for an alteration to a historical structure in the DOD. Thank you. Um, so how does that, uh, how, what would you like to say to that point, Beth, now that you've got the clarification? So I think then I would say that what has been proposed, I believe would impair the character of the district. The project as proposed, which I think is what we are talking about, the addition yes. to the historic building. Correct. Yes. Bonnie, this uh, is Tanya. This is Tanya. Can I just say that if, if we're talking about the requested use, the requested use of the proposed project is no different than what's there now. And so I don't see where, where it would be detrimental to the health and welfare of the neighborhood given the parking and the office use that's currently on the lot do not seem to be impairing the integrity or character of the district or the adjoining district. Okay, thank you. Bonnie, um, I, I actually have a different point of view and I, I think it might be more in line with Beth's. I, I think that the only reason we're looking at these general special permit findings is because there's an application for a DOD special permit. Is that correct? The two go together. Yes, the DOD not, requires the that all the criteria. So it has nothing to do with the bank use or the parking use or anything like that. It all has to do with the permit for the DOD to which, so I think it's, I think this is a redundant, um, you know, it's, it's almost saying the same thing as the DOD is saying, does the DOD, does the granting of the DOD special permit impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts. I, I don't think it has anything to do with the bank use. And that's that's why I've been so, you know, it's it's so unfortunate that this all gets gets wrapped up in whether we want to have business development and commercial development and the lot and so forth. I think it's all about the DOD. And and so I think this you you answer this the same way you answered the same question for DOD. I'm, I'm with you because I was going to say exactly that. I, I think I've already covered it um, in my other response. Um, 
But have you been clear about what your response was on the DOD? As clear <laughs> as you want to be? Um, I would, yeah, I would say I don't think it is consistent or, or it is not uh, compatible. Um, but I think it's, I think it's just because um, the you can do so much with the skin of the building. I, you know, I, I, I you know, you can. You know, there are doors there, but the doors don't seem to be active doors. They don't seem to be active windows. Basically, the building is a parking garage with a little bit of commercial space on the top floor, and I just don't feel that that is um, really compatible with that neighborhood. It's, it's really, it's dead space on the ground floor, primarily. There's some, there is some uh, open space, but there's a lot of, the most of the length long prospect is, is dead space. And I just don't feel that it, it uh, that combined with the massing of the building um, works with the properties across the street. Okay, thank you for being so clear. Um, I already said I don't think it's compatible, but that's in relationship also to what Rick was saying that um, my comments previously on the DOD criteria um, apply here as well. Uh, Bonnie, this is Don. With, with respect to the what's on the uh, screen right now, the general special permit findings, and my interpretation, it talks about use. It does not refer to something about massing, whatever, so I do believe that um, the application uh, meets uh, this particular special permit finding. Okay, thank you. I'd like to have comments from everybody, please, even if they're short and... Um, I'll comment this one, Jay. I, I guess some... Um... Again, Rick said it best. It's that we're creating something, this use that is really a parking garage with a non-active facade on a residential street. And I feel like it is not in character with the neighborhood. Okay. I, I would agree with that. Who's that? Ann. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Who am I missing? Leah. Leah, are you still with us? Hello, Leah. Could you please unmute and give us a comment? So you want us to just sort of summarize our positions, is that right? Well, I'd like you to speak to this ge uh, general um, special permit condition, uh, a criterion that asks for us to um, look at the use yes. as it fits in the neighborhood and yeah, yeah, its yeah. compatibility, right? Um, no, I, I think to be consistent, I would I would say um, I would I would say the same thing that I said uh, for for the DoD issue, um, and and I think there is a degree of compatibility. It's a tricky one when you phrase it that way. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's from everybody on general special permit findings. We will now go to the highlighted sections under site plan review, which are going to be repetitive. We know that already. Um, I don't know any other way to get through it, except to ask for your comments once again on each section. Um, if someone has a better or more experience with doing this way, way of doing it, either Rick or Andy, please let me know. No. All right, let's let's carry on with site plan review criteria. Community character on the proposed development. Actually, what I could do is ask each person just to speak to all of them, which means that Andy's gonna have to 
flip through them um, so each person can see the highlighted areas and make your comments and then we don't have to go back and forth with everybody. Um, so let's try that and see if we can do site plan review criteria all at once for each person. Hi, can I make a comment to that? I, I think it works better the other way where we're actually having more of a dialogue, it seems to me. Um, on each each on each category. Well, I think it it helps. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you'd like to focus, for example, first just on community character and have everybody comment on that, and then move on to traffic and parking. Just to clarify what you're it, suggesting. That's just my opinion. I mean, I'm open to all opinions here. I, <laughs> I agree. Okay. Yeah. Let's stick to the topic then, rather than one voice droning on. All right. All right. Um, start us off, MJ. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, I guess in this sense, I, I do feel like this, this, this structure fits into the character of the community. It's a brick building. Um, its height is, um, not it certainly has other examples in town that are very similar. Um, it is not really in harmony with the adjacent buildings. Um, and uh, I still think um, it's not appropriate in its overall size. Um, it's architectural detailing I think is appropriate here. Um, I don't mind the brick. Um, I think those are all my comments really. The massing is the problem. Thank you. This is Rick. Um, I think I'm, I feel the same way. I guess I uh, feel like items four and seven are problematic, um, but the rest of it is, seems to be um, consistent. So I think that items four and seven really, um, really kind of replicate our concerns about the DOD. Uh, and I guess, you know, one of the things here, and maybe um, I see Jonathan Eichmann's name popping up on my screen, maybe I should ask him uh, if, if it's possible. As we're looking at a site plan review, which is different than a special permit, uh, it seems to me that our, uh, we may have less um, leeway maybe in how we evaluate these criteria, is that, is that true? Um, through you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that's generally true of site plan review, right? The use is um, either special permit or as of right, but the site plan criteria is there to determine whether the use, uh, which has already been determined either as of right or by special permit can be can comply with the site plan review criteria. It's essentially a, um, a technical review of the project. So, so to follow up on that, I think that at least for this, at least for the community character portion of these um, criteria, it almost seems that these, if we, if we, it, whatever we decide about DOD really flows through to these criteria and, and we can't be, really be inconsistent in that way. And I think that's why four and seven jump out, jump out at me. Are you done, Rick? Yes, I'm saying, I am. <laughs> okay. This is Tanya. Um, I um, I would agree that this meets the community character. I think that the um, the proposed structure fits in with um, with the downtown what? district that it's located in, and as was shown by the applicant. And um, I think that they've been able to um, to provide the screening and whatnot that has been asked. That's mine, that's it, that's it. Uh, I guess I don't think it meets the community character in that um, 
it's not in harmony with the immediate neighborhood. And um, I'm with, this is Bonnie, I'm with Rick on four and seven in that it's not in harmony and that um, it um, is not appropriate size and shape um, in relationship to the land area. That's back to my earlier comment about context matters. Um, I had some concern about the other two criteria um, uh, being located in the National Historic District is consistent with the architectural style, scale, and density. Again, when you start getting into scale and density and massing, um, I've got a problem, but the rest of that's okay. The setbacks, as I said earlier, we can uh, approve dimensional requirements that are um, different from the underlying zoning. And in this case, it definitely is advantageous to have the setbacks um, greater than the underlying requires. But for those other issues, I'm not seeing the compatibility. We have from everybody else so we can move on. Sorry, I haven't spoken yet, but Sorry, I haven't spoken yet. But I agree with you, Bonnie. And I don't think it meets the community character the requirement. Community character. Yeah, I, I haven't said anything yet. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I do think it's compatible with the neighborhood, but is it in harmony with the neighborhood? It's in harmony with the downtown district, and it it accommodates itself well to the residential neighborhood. Harmony is a bit harder. Uh, honey, this is Don. Um, I think it. I, I think it does meet I, I think it does the compatibility with the neighborhood. To me, the issue which I've raised before is it's really, there's two neighborhoods. There's the commercial neighborhood, and then there is the residential neighborhood. If one says it meets with the commercial, but not the residential, then to me, we're making a decision that one neighborhood takes precedence over the other with respect to um, you know, our decision. In my opinion, they should be uh, treated equally. I didn't see anything in the zoning that says one's more important than the other. So uh, be because of that, I, I, I view that, that it does meet this criteria that it's, it's harmonious. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on this? Um community character before we move on. All right, let's move to traffic, parking, and public access. Bonnie? Yes. Um, I, I, I would like just to say that I'm happy with B, C, D, E, and F, <laughs> if we can get through that. I don't, I don't see a, uh, I don't see issues with any of the remaining things under this. We don't have uh, to go through any of those, but uh, the lower ones, we don't have to do health, public services, et cetera, but we do have to do traffic and parking only because it's been highlighted by um, the staff that that was um, needed confirmation. I guess, I guess I'm just saying that I, it fall, for me, it falls into the same category. It's, it's non-controversial non to me. Okay. Does anyone have anything specific to say about traffic? No, it doesn't. I don't think the impact has changed. Okay, no change in impact. Let's move on to the next highlighted one um, comes under development and performance standards. 
Andy, can you move us just down to that to see if there are any comments on sidewalks, crosswalks, and walkways, et cetera? None here. Any? Oh, it's Don. Yeah. No concern, Rick. Any concerns? Let's put it the other way around. Any concerns? No concerns. Okay. Um, there's a separate one under H6 for parking areas. Again, I don't see the, the problematic, anything problematic with that. Does anybody else? On the current design, H9. obviously. HA9. No comment? No comment about the proposed parking. Anyone else? All right, let's go to um, HB site plan and architectural design. Bonnie, I, I think that Number one and number two, again, they just flow from the DOD analysis. Uh, but I think everything else, unless unless there are other people who have concerns about the remainder, I think that the other ones have all been taken care of. But again, height, bulk, and massing are what we talked about in, in DOD. And I would reinforce that with. Um, Number three, where appropriate large continuous buildings should be avoided and massing of buildings should be broken up and staggered. They've made a um, reasonably good attempt at that, but um, I think um, it's just the overall height and bulk of one and two that make three kind of difficult to agree with for me. So if I'm not hearing any comment, can I assume that your DOD comments, as Rick has stated, cover one and two, height and bulk? That's how I feel. OK. Yep. okay. And, and Bonnie, to that point, uh, it's just that some of the planning board members have a different view, right? So, oh, absolutely. You're, right. So, you're, so okay. Whatever, yeah, whatever your view was. Was, yeah, okay. I just wanted to be sure that that's yeah. fine. No, I'm you. not saying that we all agree. Absolutely not. No. Okay. Um, for everyone that holds. Just DOD. quickly, Bonnie, Bonnie, yes. can I ask a question on this? Um, as far as the height and the bulk massing, is, um, are we saying that it beats the zoning requirement or are we saying that in our, in our view? No, our, this goes our, back to what um, I was trying to get at when I um, quoted Attorney Eichmann at the beginning, that mm -hmm. it has to do with the review of the, the overlay district which drives all of our other considerations because the special permit is based on that and the site plan is based on that. It's okay. None so of we're this not, that we're, we're not looking now. at the dimensional, we're not looking at the dimensional requirements within the zoning ordinance. We're looking at our interpretation of the special permit guidelines. That's that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But it but but the the piece that's most important of that is the guidelines and that anything that we comment on refers to them and aren't, you know, random personal statements. I guess that okay. was what I was referring to. So I would yeah. just reiterate that I, that I would um, think that they meet the requirements of the zoning ordinance based on the dimensional requirements in the zoning ordinance. Okay. Bonnie, could I uh, interject something here? Sure. Uh, so this list is important that we're looking at, but it, what it doesn't include is the paragraphs that lead up to the list. And I'd like, just like to read the paragraphs that are under site plan and architectural design so you know what we're supposed to be looking at here. And it says, 
in determining the appropriate, appropriateness of buildings, the basic design elements of proposed buildings should be evaluated in relation to existing adjacent or surrounding buildings. In most cases to be considered appropriate, new buildings should respect the architectural character of adjacent buildings, or in the case of multi-tenant commercial centers, the overall architectural theme of the center. Importantly, when new buildings or additions are considered compatibility rather than conformity is desired. The planning board will use the basic design elements listed below when reviewing applications. So that's, that's what leads to this list. So it's not just, it's, it's not saying, does this it's clearly not saying, does this comply with zoning? It's saying, is the height appropriate for the around, surrounding area? Thanks for the clarification. If that's the case, Rick, I'm sorry. How are you making that determination? Pardon me? I said, if that's the case, Rick, how are you making that determination that it's not compatible with, um, how would how would how would we say yes this is is or is not because we have if we don't said, have, if we're not looking at the for those of us who objective are, criteria right for those of us who have it, we're all going to look at this differently uh, because it's not objective it's looking mm -hmm. it's, it's basically reflect a very similar language to the downtown overlay district language and I would suspect that if the, if we felt that bulk in general met if if it, in reviewing the downtown overlay district. Um, and said that it didn't, it didn't meet the massing requirements or the massing criteria of that, we would have to use the same analysis looking here because it's talking about looking at consistency with adjacent buildings. So I, you, know, you, can, you can look at the, I, it's, you can look at the, the paragraph leading up to it, um, mm -hmm. but it's clear that it's not asking for a dimensional comparison to, uh, to the zoning standards because that's, that's a different, that's not a site plan review an analysis, that's a zoning compliance analysis, which is different. Does that change your, your statement previously, Tanya, about it does not. requirements? Okay. It does not. It no. should not, right. <laughs> Okay, fine. All right. Um, again, I will take a shortcut here if you let me, if you don't want me to, uh, inter intervene. I will say that anybody who hasn't commented on on um, architectural design is assuming that their statements previously relating to DOD on a similar topic um, hold for here. Okay, uh, we'll move on to general architectural character. Rick, if you have the ordinance in front of you, is there an introductory paragraph to this that would be helpful to us? Um, the planning board shall not consider interior arrangement or architectural features not subject to public view from the public way or public property. Building design shall be compatible with the vernacular structure, historic character, and scale of buildings in the surrounding neighborhood, including the following design elements. Okay. So that puts into context this uh, list. Well, I'm still in the same position I was before. I don't think it's certainly um, not in not in character with the immediate neighborhood. Um, it is in character with State Street um, farther away, um, but I wouldn't expect it to be uh, with all those details, all the features of of the building as much as I am still concerned about both the horizontal, mostly the horizontal emphasis of the building. I'm sorry, vertical, the height. Um, and if I keep saying this, if that could be adjusted um, in a way that would then change the design of the buildings so that it's not so massive, I think it would fit in both, um, the commercial and the residential area. Um, I, I'll just add my, um, add my seven five. Are you done? I'm sorry, Bonnie. Are you Go done? Go right ahead, my MJ. Um, 
that um, I just think this is an interesting place to talk about the fact that the certificate of appropriateness from the historical commission is not being. Uh, but that's not. I'm sorry. I just wanted to point that out. I should have earlier. That's not applicable because we don't have a local historic district here. Even though we have a historical commission that is advisory. Totally different. Okay. Local historic district is Fruit Street. The only right. one. Right. No, I understand that. Okay. okay. So this, I, I'm, I'm assuming this means local historic district in capital letters, because that's what they require. There's something there called a certificate of appropriateness for people to, um, for applicants to be approved. Um, so that language is not relevant to our consideration. Okay. Again, is silence um, con representing consistency with prior comments from each of the members? And if not, please speak up now. Uh, Bonnie, I, um, I don't think this really, I think this is different. Um, so I think this talks about a lot of stuff that, that I think Leah talked about in some earlier meetings about the arrangement of windows and, and that sort of thing. So I don't think this, and the, the horizontal or vertical vertical emphasis of the building, I think in this, in this um, context means, do you have um, windows that are taller than they are wide, um, or do you have shop front windows that are wider than they are tall? I think it's, it's that type of emphasis that they're talking about, not height. I think they've dealt with height in the previous one. So I think this is really all about architecture. And, and so I, I guess I would say I don't have any, this is an area where I would be different from my point of view on on the downtown overlay district. I, you know, if if the building were, if I felt that the building were okay in that location in terms of the scale and everything, I'd probably be okay with the architecture. So that's that's a little bit different here, I think. Let me just push back on you on the second one, scale, height, and width proportions. Proportion, that's again looking at proportions. So the proportion of height versus width is I, okay. I don't have a, I don't have a strong point of view on that, I guess is what I say, because okay. I don't understand those things as well. I, I think this is meant to be different than scale and massing. Yes. Okay. This right. is referring to the features and the proportions, not not the general bulk of the thing. That's my that's my understanding of it. And and I I, I agree, and I I also will um, um, kind of change my opinion in that I feel like you know what they've done with their design is actually appropriate, and I think that um, there's nothing wrong with the proportions in general. And I, I, then I have to go back and change my comment because I'm there as well. Proportions and, and features and details on what they have there work. And that's basically their response this time around from our previous meeting, um, as far as I'm concerned. So in this, um, I need to hear from everybody on this one because you may be changing your um, comments relative to other ones you've said on other parts of either the site plan review criteria or DOD. Uh, I, this is Tanya, I, I don't. I don't have any any changes. I do not either. I don't have a problem with the architectural character of the building they've designed. This is Don, no changes. We got everybody? I haven't. Um, if it's, yes, the architectural character, not considering the bulk and size, I am okay. I think they've done the best they can. They can with that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to, unless somebody has some comments on these, the next one highlighted is lighting. Um, I don't think there's any issue there. Um, we went through that ages ago um, with the site um, designer. And the other um, highlighted area beyond that is um, 
exposed storage areas, um, and screening basically. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up on either of those two? No problem. Okay, I think we've covered everything. So um, at this point, I had promised, is there anything else on the planning board members before I move on? I All right. Just, can we just go back to the special permit findings? Sure. I'm just concerned about this idea of use. Because the banking use obviously is fine. It is the project as proposed that I have the issue with. But are we clear that that's the language? I mean, the or that that's what we're looking at? The use, list, the use requested is listed in the table of use regulations. That seems to me to be the use as in the banking use. Well, if I go back to what Attorney Eichmann said, um, he can certainly come on um, and clarify, but he did say that it was the requested use to alter the historic building. So it's the banking use. Does that answer your question? Well, the banking use in, in general oh. versus the use that they are specifically, the permit that they're specifically applying for. I just wanna make sure we're not being inconsistent and somebody's not gonna say, oh, we, you said banking was not appropriate. I, I mean, banking would be appropriate under that first bullet, the use requested right. listed in the table of use regulations. So I, I, but when I we're no, so I, I just read this one as differently in terms of um, will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts. Um, I, would, I could make a proposal to say that we could, we could stipulate when we, when we vote on this, <laughs> that that's what we're talking about, the banking use. Um, because we're for, before we even get there, we have to vote on the the DOD special criteria. So it, it would not if if we were to vote if the vote were to be against granting the DOD or if, if the vote were to be that the that the proposed application did not satisfy the DOD criteria. Hmm then it wouldn't matter in a sense how we found on these general special permit findings. It only matters if we were to vote to say that the DOD criteria were satisfied. Does, does that make sense? No, it doesn't to me because the DOD is a special permit and it references the right. general special permit findings. So don't they go hand in glove? I, I think they do. My, that was my interpretation, but I, but I, the way I think of it is, if we were to vote that the that it did not satisfy the criteria that is, um, it's compatible with the surrounding neighborhood, then everything else we under the general special permit findings is is almost irrelevant because we it hasn't even passed you know passed that bar but maybe Attorney Eichmann could help out with that again. Attorney Eichmann, yes, could Madam you speak? Senior. Yes. Yes, I, just briefly, uh, that section 7A1, I think is the focus here. Um, I think that section is fairly straightforward. I don't think there's a need to get too confused about it. I think it says that the board is supposed to review whether the use requested is listed in the table of use regulations or elsewhere as requiring a special permit or whether it's similar in character to permitted uses. I think the only distinction made here is the board's supposed to determine whether this is a use that can obtain a special permit. And clearly it is, it's listed as a DOD special permit. So I think 
just by the fact that everybody understands this is a DOD special permit request, I think this category is satisfied. So right. pulling, pulling out right. one element of it is not relevant. The whole thing goes as a package if the DOD is acceptable or not acceptable. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I, it's just saying, is this particular special permit use listed in the table of use regulations? Well, clearly it is. Um, it, the use in question here is the, the DOD special permit. Um, that is a listed, you know, taken broadly, that's a use listed, a special permit use listed in the ordinance. So I think it satisfies that right there. Okay, so the use is the DOD special permit, not Correct. thinking. Yes. Okay. okay. Does anyone want to speak about this at all, anymore? Okay. Um, I um, mentioned earlier that after we finished going through all these criteria and findings that we would go back, give the applicant an opportunity to speak again. Um, and I'd like to do that at this time. Uh, Madam Chair, the applicant has nothing further. We thank the board for their time. Okay, thank you. So at this point, I am going to call for a vote. We, I want to discuss if this is how we want the wording of the vote, the, uh, the motion, um, which has been suggested to us in the staff report. I'll read it. Um, motion to approve the DOD special permit and site plan review applications for 93 State Street pending the board's review and approval of draft decisions to be provided by the Office of Planning and Development for review at the meeting of April 7th. Does anyone have any um, alterations to suggest to that motion? I don't, but Bonnie, could you remind us how many votes are needed for pass? Uh, the special permit, there need to be six um, votes um, to approve. And we are down one member because Alden um, joined us after these hearings began and is ineligible to vote. So there'll be eight of us voting and uh, six of us have to vote yes for this to be approved. So Bonnie, do you want a motion? Uh, I'll, I'll make I'll move that motion. Well, I just wanted to make sure before you make the motion that it's there are no alterations to that motion being up for discussion. Hearing none, um, Don makes the motion. Do I have a second? I will second it. And I will call roll. Alden Clark. Yeah, you know, I've recused myself as, as I have not participated in the full discussion. Beth DeLeal. No. Ann Gardner? No. Tanya Hartford? Yes. Leah McGavern? Yes. Rick Tainter? No. MJ Verde? No. Don Walters? Yes. Bonnie Sontag? No. It does not pass. It is not, not, Madam not approved. Chair, Madam Chair, I would just like to remind the board that the applicant is requested to withdraw the special permit for ITIF without prejudice. I see that and uh, I'll take a motion to that effect, please. Go move, Bonnie. Thank you, ITIF. Don second. and second. Rick. Ann, yes. Ann, oh, wait a minute. Ann, are you seconding it? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, 
And I'll call roll again on withdrawal of the ITIF special permit. Um, Alden? I recuse myself. Beth? Yes. Anne? Yes. Tanya? Yes. Leah? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Don? Yes. Bonnie, yes. So that is taken care of attorney me. Thank you for the reminder. All right, we are done. Um, oh, I'm, oh, do you know what? I didn't officially close the public hearing before we took a vote. Would, um, would people- I thought you did, I think you did, Bonnie. I closed the, the public comment section but please excuse me and insert that appropriately, um, Linda, for having closed the public hearing before we took a vote. Um, I was just rushing through my own agenda here. All right, um, thank you everybody um, for your patience and stamina and commitment and everything else that's been um, exercised in hearing all of the comments, uh, reviewing the proposals, and to everybody who's participated from the applicant through the abutters and other members of our community. Um, we always appreciate as a planning board to have as much input as we can get. And um, we thank you for your participation. Are there any other updates, Andy, that you would like to have um, us know about before we close the meeting tonight? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, no, I, uh, I don't know if, um, if uh, Attorney Eichmann would offer any guidance for the board uh, at this point, given the, the board's vote this, uh, this evening uh, on moving forward, uh, with formalizing the, the board's action. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I don't have anything. I think uh, it's set up that the um, the planning department will draft the decision for the board's consideration. The board will take a vote on it um, and fi ultimately file that decision with the city clerk. I think that's the appropriate process. And thank you also for um, helping us out, Attorney Eichmann. We appreciate your participation. Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. This is Tanya, so, so moved. Thank you, Tanya. I'll second. Anne, second. Anne has a second. Um, oh, yes, the list. Alden. Yes. Beth. Yes. Anne. Um, Anne. Yes. Tanya. Yes. Leah. Yes. Rick. Rick, adjourn. Are you ready to adjourn, Rick? I'd already, I'd already joined myself. <laughs> you already had, yes. right. thank you. MJ? Yes. Don? Yes. Uh, and myself, yes. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you, Bonnie.